Ah, there we go. Okay. Yay. You did it. Yay. Wow. Okay. Now it takes a moment um, after Zoom goes live, and I'll tell you when it is. Okay. Zoom is now live. And now I go back. Wait. Got to kill that. And uh, okay. And we are live. Except I have one more thing. I'm getting an echo on this one. There we go. <laughs> All right. So we're trying some new technology here. Uh, so um, I'm, I just ask that everybody else, except for Joe and myself, who um, um, are on the Zoom call, please don't go on video and or, or audio unless you're asking a question or making a comment. Uh, because if you're on video, then in fact, you might not be able to go on video. Because Well, no, I think you can. But just don't do it until you're asking a question later on. So with that, I want to welcome everyone to Climate Chat. I'm your host, Dan Miller. I have a very special guest today, Joe Rom. Joe and I have known each other for a very long time. I was trying to think how long ago. And uh, it was <laughs> it's at least like 15 years, maybe, I think. in some I, of the I can't exactly remember the... the yeah, yeah, time. some of the early uh, Al Gore stuff. I know we were chatting then and, yeah, and, that was, and some uh, other, things, you know? other things as well. And Joe has been a leading climate communicator for as long as I can remember, had one of the first and one of the most important uh, climate change blogs, I would call it, or, or websites or climate yeah. progress. Um, and has done a, worked for the Department of Energy. I was just uh, debating a friend of mine who I debated on Clubhouse actually about hydrogen versus battery electric cars, and saw uh, you had some of the earliest articles criticizing hydrogen vehicles. I, mean, I did two thousand eight. Oh, I wrote I, my book. The hype about hydrogen came out in two thousand four. Two thousand four. Uh, wow. Because that was that was George Bush. You remember said he had a two thousand three speech saying a child born today. His first, their first car would be would run on hydrogen, and the exhaust would be water. And um, and I wrote, uh, you know, ended up saying, well, I'm going to do a primer on hydrogen. And then I looked <laughs> into it, and I said, well, maybe not so much a primer. <laughs> so, well, by the way, we could probably spend an hour talking about that, but we're not going to yeah. talk about that. Um, by the way, is there anything about your background or what you're doing now? I just gave a very high overview. Maybe you could spend a minute uh, just talking about your background and what you're up to now. Uh, well, you know, I have a PhD in physics from MIT and, uh, yeah, uh, worked for Amory Lovins for two years. Uh, uh, that was sort of my, my first start in energy. Um, I had worked for Peter Goldmark at the Rockefeller Foundation for two years, um, as his special assistant to help him on sort of new <clears throat> investments in environmental and energy security and, uh, got to talk to a lot of very smart people. I was pretty young then and asked them sort of what's the next big thing. And they all said energy and climate. So I looked around to places I could get some more training. And a friend of mine, uh, Anjali Sastry, was working with Amory. Uh, and I ended up working with him for two years. And then the Clinton administration came in, and he recommended me and some other people for jobs. And I ended up being special assistant to deputy secretary. And then ultimately as acting assistant secretary of energy for energy efficiency and renewable energy. Uh, so that was... Wow. That was the whole, you know, billion dollar program. You know, that was the like the venture capital of clean energy, uh, you know, back then. And and we did hydrogen and fuel cells and solar and wind and electric batteries, you know, advanced batteries, alternative fuel vehicles, et cetera. So um, and then I wound my way, did a lot of consulting in clean energy uh for a long time, helping companies design greenhouse gas mitigation strategies. Uh my brother lost his home in Hurricane Katrina, uh, August 29, 2005, and asked me if he should rebuild. And that's sort of what got me talking to climate scientists and reading the literature and realizing the situation was more dire than I thought. Uh, and I should do, uh, and the climate scientists weren't doing a good job of communications. Uh, and so I decided to become a full-time communicator um, because both my parents had been writers and I had that, that background. And that led to climate progress. Uh, which I did for 14 years, which was wow. great. Um, until Think Progress, Center for American Progress shut down all of 
the news sites at at the center, the Think Progress, and the the casualty was Climate Progress. Um, although it was good, it was reasonable time for a change after 14 years. Um, and then most recently, um, I in June started working for Michael Mann. <clears throat> oh, climatologist okay. Michael Mann in September of last year launched the Center for Science, Sustainability, and Media at University of Pennsylvania. So he moved from where he had been, Penn State, running their sort of climate effort for a couple decades. He wanted to do more communications, and obviously he has emerged, in my mind, as the best communicating climate scientist. And he's been, you know, putting out a book every year, and he's, he's you know, making himself available. And so they, he created, with the help of Kathleen Hall Jameson and the Annenberg Center at University of Pennsylvania, this you know, combination of science, sustainability in the media. And the minute I saw it, I said, oh, you know, that's kind of, you know, areas I'm interested in. And I'm, a, you know, I've known Mike a long time. So it took a while. But yeah, in June, I started as a senior research fellow um, and have been putting out papers um, uh, on starting with the kind of the climate solutions that I think are a bit overhyped. Uh, and and I will get to the ones that I think are, you know, uh, uh not you know are are going to be the solutions i think actually everybody knows what those are uh but still they um you know uh so that's what i've been doing is, is wow is, i didn't know, it, realize this about, about michael well that, yeah, that's yeah. very much in line with what we'll be talking about today because i know that uh, michael's against uh carbon capture and things like that and and uh, good because i get to ask you some questions i can't ask him uh like uh, he's also very controversial among the cl climate activists, some of the positions he's taking. I I, I just have to interject and say, yeah. I wish we had um, more um, reaction music like they have in oh. um, Club Deck, because when Joe said that he worked with Michael Mann, um, I don't know. I just thought there should have been an emphasis. Bum, bum, bum. Okay, I can, yeah. I can do the bump, bump, bump. Thanks, Stacey. And, and he is at, I'm sorry, he's at um, Penn versus Penn State now? Is that what you He's at University of Pennsylvania, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. Did he move? I just, I grew up in Pennsylvania and um, in between the two. And well, you know, yeah, that's the, I, I don't, you know, he's, he's, uh, done some, he, he's got a place in, in Philadelphia, yeah, near, okay. near the university, yeah. Okay. okay. No. All right, cool. So, Thank you. I can't wait to hear more. I'm going to leave you to the letting the people in, Stacy. Too. Okay. Great. Thanks. So, um, so we'll have, be able to talk about some, maybe some of these issues that you know, sure. uh, my, what Michael would bring up, and I have some some questions for him. I'll ask you instead, and it relates to your paper. So let's let's get into your paper. Um, it's called "Why Direct Air," well, sorry, "Why Direct Air Carbon Capture and Storage DAC D A C C S is not scalable." And, quote, net zero is a dangerous myth. And uh, this is part of the, uh, you wrote this as part of the Penn Center for Science, Sustainability, and the Media. And and, I, and, and that's one of three things I've, I've published since being there, right? Right. And uh, there's also a related one about BEX. And I by the way, so for, for this, for today, you're going to be speaking with, obviously, with myself, but even everyone who's part of Climate Chat is very well versed in sure. air capture. However, we are on YouTube Live, and we do plan that these videos will be spread, you know, far more in the future, sure. including to people who are not as familiar with you know, some of the names of, of, of things like that. So could you maybe at the very high, I got lots of questions for you because I read through the, uh, the paper, but just to start us off, can you just give us a very high level view of what the paper is about, and also briefly explain what direct air capture is. Sure. Well, you know, <clears throat> at at the highest level, um, you know, since the nations of the world in Paris, December 2015, unanimously said, you know, that we are going to try to uh, keep total warming from pre-industrial levels well below two degrees Celsius. That was the, the main goal, but it also added, you know, but we, you know, we're going to try hard to keep it to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And that was sort of the aspirational goal. And um, that is the UN framework convention on climate change. That's all the member states, which is pretty much every country in the world. And, you know, uh, this is live now at the end of this month, the 28th conference of the parties to that convention are all meeting uh, in Dubai. Mm -hmm. um, 
and um, the UN framework, all the all the nations of the world asked all the scientists, would you do a closer study of 1.5 degrees Celsius? Do a, they do a special report and tell us the latest science on, you know, how worried should we be about one point about hitting 1.5 versus two? And what would we have to do to get there, et cetera, et cetera. And that report came out, I think, in 2018. And it said, yes, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, climate change has been happening, you know, maybe in some respects faster than we thought. And yes, it is extremely dangerous to go above uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, and by the way, wherever temperature you want to stabilize, whether it's 1.5 or 2 or anything, you have to get total emissions down to net zero. I mean, you have to get total emissions down to zero, but the net is, uh, and this is where, you know, uh, direct air capture and some other things come in, um, you know, total uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, 50 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions are emitted every year, about uh, 40 billion CO2, 10 billion are the other gases, methane and and, and some of the other ones. And, and um, so the question is, do you have to reduce those 50 down to zero, or maybe you could take those 50 down to 10 if you could develop technologies that could pull 10 billion tons of CO2 out of the air, right? So you wouldn't necessarily have to get all of the very hard to reduce sectors. And there clearly are some things that are going to be hard to eliminate entirely. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, this idea that we were going to need carbon dioxide removal is something that had evolved through the last 20 years as the climate modelers realized over time that more people wanted to keep us below two and then at 1.5. And um, so they put in the models, these uh, these carbon dioxide removal strategies, which in the literature are CDR. And, mm -hmm. and there are three, um, the three most modeled, most prominent, most studied of the uh, carbon dioxide removal are trees, planting trees, Mm -hmm. uh, reforestation, anything like that. Uh, number two is bioenergy carbon capture and storage, which is using biomass to pull CO2 out of the air. Then you could burn the biomass, use a carbon capture and storage system to capture that CO2 and bury it. So that would potentially be the equivalent of negative emissions. And then this third one, which is direct air carbon capture and storage. Also, do, oh, you froze for a second. Uh, it's called direct air capture, but okay. you know we'll understand that it's going to have a. Yeah, and so you, you froze for a second, by the way. So I was going to oh. say, uh, so d your phrase, uh, direct air carbon capture and storage, is also used as DAC, just direct air capture yes. DAC, and they're the same thing. Okay, I'm going to move uh, my computer just uh, uh, a little closer to my router, if that's okay. Uh, that that might be good because you just froze there for a moment. Yeah. We don't want that yeah, to happen. Yeah, uh, hopefully, hopefully this will will address that question. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes yeah. I do this. Sometimes I I don't have to do this, but I. Ah, here we go. Uh, there we go. This should be. Uh, okay. This hopefully. Live will... action here on our live climate chat. Yeah, I, I, I should just set it up. But here. now you have some backlighting, so you, know, you may turn on some lights in front of you so we can see you. Uh, yeah, I just need to um, do this. Um, I don't know. I could put on. Uh, sorry. Uh, let's see what this does. Probably helps and, a little bit. Yeah, and I will turn this way maybe to get some light on me. Um, uh, so hopefully this will be good enough. Okay. So, All right, is great. this okay? So, yep, as long as you, uh, you're you not... Stacey, you have a question before we continue on because you're on video. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I well, I was I didn't know how long the adjustments would take. And so oh. I wanted to just put in some um, filler and a bookmark <laughs> for later on. I do want to hear more about um, hydrogen, but let's do all the other. Also, Stacey, I didn't have yeah. a chance to do it. Could you also just post uh, the YouTube link on Twitter again or repost my um, yeah, my I'll post? Yeah, because I, I did a coming up, but I didn't get a chance to do. A, We're live. Yep. I will <laughs> okay. do that right now. Thank you. Well, we, I'm I'm. 
I'm going to be here for a couple hours. We will certainly be able to get a little bit of hydrogen in, I think. Um, and, okay. and I will say, by the way, that in my mind, direct air capture and hydrogen are, are similar in some respects. Huh. Um, okay. And, and so direct air capture um, involves pulling CO2 out of the air. And, um, uh, and then uh, capturing it and then doing the carbon capture and storage, which is to say you're gonna compress it to a thousand pounds per square inch, uh, put it through a pipeline and uh, bury it under, uh, you know, hopefully in a permanent geologic repository. Um, and each one of those steps is a challenge. You know, we, we sure. it, you know, nothing, none of the things that I have described are anywhere near commercial. Um, and so all- Nope. You froze again for a moment. That uh, that has proved challenging. Regular carbon capture and storage has proved challenging, right? We spent the last 20 years trying to, to just put carbon capture and storage systems on coal plants and um, and also other things like uh, that are easier, like natural gas processing. Um, but fundamentally, we haven't been terribly successful in 20 years. So it, it is a challenge uh, uh, to do those things. Um, but let's go. So direct air capture. So, you know, the challenge here is that, you know, CO2 is very diffuse in the air, right? It's famously around 420 parts per million. 0.04% so, of the atmosphere. Yeah. And so um, in, in the Houston Astrodome, there is about one ton of CO2. So mm -hmm. you know, if you're going to extract large amounts of CO2, you're clearly going to have to have a system that pulls through your devices uh, a large volume of air, right? You're going to need a vast number of devices that can that can capture CO2 out of the air, and then you're going to have to move huge volumes of air in order to get, uh, and you know, if you want to get you know anywhere near a million or ten million tons, obviously you're going to have to be moving. So typically, we're talking a very large array of fans which kind of suck the air and run it near a sorbent. Mm -hmm. uh, and that sorbent will, will absorb um, or dissolve. If, if it, if it, if it takes the CO2 into the liquid, if it's a liquid, right, it'll dissolve in and it will absorb it. And if it's a solid, it will bring the CO2 on the surface and it will adsorb it with the D instead of the B. And those are the two main systems. Um, right. And um, so, you know, right off the bat, uh, it's clear that this is going to be a very energy intensive process. I, I, I think that was, you know. Well, that's by the way, let's let's talk about well a couple of things getting back to your the Houston Astrodome. That is true. But of course, we do have devices that process far, far, far more air than that. They're called wind tur turbines. And they, I, I, I think one wind turbine can in a year processes like the flow of all water used by humanity <laughs> because, you know, because there's just, you know, if you have a few meters per second uh, times the area of the winter. Oh, it's sure. Huge, it's, huge, it's... huge airflows are sometimes involved in renewable energy as just one example. Um, oh, right. Although and energy and energy intensity is the other one that you bring up a lot in the paper. So oh, why don't we just start diving in and I'll, I'll start asking you some questions about that. Because uh, I think that most of the uh, di direct air capture systems that I'm aware of, and I should make a plug, by the way, that I did interview uh, interview Klaus Lackner, and it's also on our YouTube homepage for everybody listening. Sure. You can listen to it. He's considered the godfather of carbon capture. I've been working on yeah. it for over 20 years. And, um, and his original system was a moisture swing system. Most of the current ones are thermal swing. But in either case... Um, you can use energy that's not man-made electricity. For example, the moisture swing uses dry air and water as the main capture cycle systems. And um, the Climework system, which is a good example of an ex ex the first commercial, I guess they say, uh, DAC system running in Iceland, it uses geothermal heat and cooling air as the main source of energy. Now, it it does use some energy to blow fans and the you know, pumps and, and you know, electrical equipment and things like that. 
And that comes from actually ge geothermal electricity as well. So none of these, oh, that one, well, neither system is using really large amounts of man-made renewable energy. And what, what what do you what do you say to that? Right, but that's because they're not doing any. But to be clear, that's because they're not doing anything substantial. Um, uh, well, and and what well, I think I mean, the that, climate. What, what does that mean? The, they're just not pulling out many tons of it, of CO two. I mean, they're not. Well, that's, they're they're, that's they're the like first. pulling out a one seconds worth of of CO two. The 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 numbers people have to understand the scale of this. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there was a 2020 review which noted that by one estimate. Uh, oh, you froze again. So air capture on wait, renewables. Is, 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 sorry, wait, start that again. You froze for a second. Energy. So, so let me finish. No, no, you you were interrupt. You you sorry. froze. Uh, uh, <laughs> so by one oh, okay. estimate, um, start with by one estimate. By one estimate, you know, renewables power direct air capture uh, would require all of the wind and solar energy generated in the US in 2018, just to capture mm -hmm. one tenth of a gigaton of CO2. So we are talking about a staggering amount of energy. And yes, they, they used Iceland, uh, but Iceland is not available in 99% of the planet. Free yeah, but, but, uh, yeah, however, the Climeworks system uses uh, temperature, you know, the heat component, is about 120 degrees Celsius. And the cooling component is air, so that's kind of available everywhere. But 120 degrees oh. Celsius heat from geothermal is available almost everywhere in the world. I mean, they, they use geothermal in Iceland because you get 350 degree, and then you can power a power plant with 350 degrees. But just to give a low-grade heat like that is available every almost everywhere in the world. And then you need to find, and they also use basalt, soil chemistry to sequester the carbon and that's available not everywhere in the world but a lot of places on earth so it's not a question of you know the question is you you put it where it works and it doesn't work everywhere but there's a lot of places where it would work and you wouldn't have to use man-made solar and wind you do because you need a staggering amount of energy. You just need a staggering amount of energy there's no there's no getting around this is one of the most inefficient processes i mean the this is you know at the Oh, you're also fr freezing again here. But... Negative energy technologies in 2019. This system overall is 5 to 10% efficient. Um, well, yeah, why does that try... mean, by the way? I saw that in your paper. What is uh, what is the efficiency? What is that measure? What does that mean? It, it's a measure of the of, of exergy. Uh, what was I said in the... Uh, it's it's. Um, well, you, just, you just said it's like 5% efficient, but that something versus something. So what is the top line and what is the bottom line of, of that efficiency? Uh, just a second. Let me give you the exact things. I don't want to um, uh, uh, give you the wrong thing here. It's um, the the uh, efficiency is exergy efficiency. It's the so-called second law of thermodynamic efficiency. It's the ratio of minimum work to real work. And um, okay. it's... it's um, Gasoline is about 10% efficient. I think, people, efficient, I think so. people are mistaken. Uh, I think people uh, really should read the scientific literature that I cite. Um, this, again, we are talking about staggering amounts of air, right? You, In the case of a wind turbine, right, the wind comes to the turbine, right? That's not going to work here, right? You're, the point of the wind turbine is, right, you have a very tall wind turbine, right? You're you putting in a place that's windy, right? If we have to limit you know, all of the, um, uh, the the siting of a direct air capture system is very hard. Th this is something that that, uh, you know, when when David Keith debated um, um, uh, uh, Herzog, uh, you know, at MIT, uh, he conceded this. The, the, let, let's be clear about how difficult the siting of this is. Right. You need to have uh, access. You, you need to be close to a place where you can bury um staggering amounts of co2 right we're not right. talking thousands of tons we're trying to get up to a billion tons of right. co2 this is a very large volume to give you an idea of the challenge of carbon capture and storage if you if we were to capture uh store if we were to capture transport and store three billion tons of co2 a year three billion tons of co2 at pressure that is to say very high pressure this is Supercritical CO2 at about a thousand mm -hmm. pounds per square inch, 
um, which is 70 times uh, atmospheric pressure, um, which which gives CO2 the energy density, about half the energy density of water. Um, that require the volume of supercritical CO2 that would need to be transported is equivalent to 90 to 100 million barrels of oil a day, which is the entire volume of water that flows. But aren't, aren't, aren't you, uh, by the way, I'm sorry, you're, you're freezing now, you're freezing now and then. You're, every you're, day, you're, okay. Yeah. Your, your Wi-Fi mm -hmm. is not working as well as you thought. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Joe, it, you, you paused out um, at, at a very, you were making a point. And okay, let me switch over to something. I don't know why this is happening. It really uh, doesn't. Turn it, turning off video might help with bandwidth. No, no, but I don't want that because we're doing YouTube live here. So we want, we want video. Yeah. Um, I mean, if it, if it gets really bad, we might have to do that. But uh, okay, me... um, it just you, we lost you at the point you were saying something about the, the volume of water and. Okay. That... Yeah. Let me. Let me. Uh, hopefully, this is. I'm switching to a mobile phone device. Um. Mm. Uh, otherwise, I will kill the video uh, if need be. Um, let's, let's give Give us a so try. The 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 volume of supercritical CO two that. 3 billion tons of CO2 capture a year equals, it equals the amount of uh, a petroleum that flows through the entire world uh, system, uh, which yeah. is 90 to 100 million barrels of oil a day. So this is, in other words, to, to reproduce that, that infrastructure, just to pipe out all of that CO2 from wherever you capture it to wherever you bury it, that is the you're going to deal with a flow that is equal to the flow of oil through the entire world economy every day. Right. But, so but, I want people uh, to understand the scale of this. The scale is staggering. When someone says to you, we're going to run this on geothermal. Right. There's not very much geothermal that can do this. You need a lot of electricity for the fans. A st Again, you're not putting this in a place of high wind. Right. Why not? So you're you, you, because those Remember, we have to site this near the storage, right? Which is all over, right? Do we have no, either saline aquifers good. or the salt the soil proven, chemistry is like proven, almost everywhere? Act, proven storage sites that are going to be monitored uh, uh, and verified over time, right? The good ones, they're limited. The places where you have the energy you want, they're also limited. Well, they're um, not, they're not, they're not. Um certified yet because no one's done, done this yet this is a brand new thing the doe right, so has just... uh reports which i'm sure you know about that show that there's a you know, hundred a thousand times more storage underground than than is needed um and plus that doesn't include basalt soil chemistry which is again being used by climeworks a company called carb fix which essentially makes club soda out of the co2 and puts it in the ground and it turns to rock you know, because of the interaction. All of with these the things may become possible over time, oh, but yeah, we're yeah. still talking about a staggering volume. Absolutely. No two. And yeah. and we're talking about a staggering amount of renewable electricity. And you are going to have to build solar and wind at volume. I mean, when you're talking again, I'll repeat the number one tenth of a gigaton of CO2, right? which is 0.2% of total mm -hmm. global emissions. 0.2% of total global emissions requires all of the solar and wind power that we generated in 2018, right? There's no mm -hmm. getting around the inherent inefficiency in a system that has to pull out CO2 that's at 420 parts per million. Well, there's well, no way well there certainly is, can... certainly is true. It's certainly true that... Um... It takes a lot of energy and it's a hell of a lot more efficient not to put it up there in the first place. Exactly. And... Let me stop you there because mm -hmm. this is the key problem with direct air capture. It is a hell of a lot more efficient not to put the CO2 up there in the first place. This is mm -hmm. the key point in the literature and is the key point in my paper. The and by the point... way, I agree. And, and I have to say, by the way, I agree 100 percent with what you just said. That well, let's, I don't know let's, 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 let's repeat what that is. I'll yeah. just say the same same Please. thing you just said, that okay. it is far, far more efficient instead of emitting 
CO2 by any form, by a power plant, by a car, by anything, and then trying to capture it with a right. direct air capture system afterwards, yeah. it you could do anything first. You could, first of all, the number one thing you should do is not emit any fossil fuel, switch to like, don't uh, put a direct air capture system on a gas power plant, shut down the gas power plant and mm -hmm. replace it with wind and solar and batteries. And not only will it be cleaner, it will be many times cheaper and many times more efficient. True for cars. Don't you know, use direct air capture to capture emissions from cars, switch them to EVs and use renewable to power them. So I'm going to hundred uh, percent, no question about it, but let's talk about well, another. Then what's the but, but wait, but what's the implication of that? No, I'm, I'm going to... the implication of that is you should not use direct air capture to reduce current or future emissions. However, right. but let me, but is there's another implication. I'll phrase it okay, in a different okay. way. It won't make sense to do massive direct air capture until you've done all the other stuff first, or most okay. of it. And I'm going to and that's that's let's let's talk about that. Yeah, because the, the the thing I think your paper isn't directly addressing, and this is what I don't think Michael Mann addresses directly either when he talks about these things, is that I would say, and I think uh, Jim Hansen uh, would agree. Oh, speaking of that, I have to excuse me interrupt for a moment because this is big news. For climate chat, uh, Jim Hansen has agreed to be our guest uh, December 17th, right after mm -hmm. COP. He's heading over to COP, and uh, and I've known Jim for a long time, worked with him a lot, but you know, getting him to go on an interview is a tough thing to do. So he's finally agreed, and he has some new stuff he's going to talk to us about that I don't even know what it's all about yet, so it should be exciting. So that's a little plug uh, for future, uh, for everyone listening. Please uh, subscribe, by the way, to the YouTube channel. We had lots of subscribers, thousands and thousands of subscribers on Clubhouse. But as we're shifting away to YouTube Live, we want you to be on YouTube. So when you have a chance, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Okay, so uh, back to what Jim Hansen says and many others is that CO2 levels are already too high. You, I'm sure you saw the pipeline paper he came out with showing that uh, uh, climate sensitivity is yeah, 4.8 degrees, not three, which means there's a lot more warming in the system as we clean up our aerosols, which will happen as we get to net zero. We're going like, to not emit all that sulfur. And therefore, there'll be far, far too much warming. So I would just say it this way. Carbon capture, direct well, from the air, carbon capture is, the purpose of it is not to reduce your current emissions. You have to you have to eliminate those. It's First. to remove past emissions. And right. if we don't do it simultaneously, we'll be, put it scientifically, screwed because it's already way too high. We're going to pass tipping points such as an AMOC collapse, not far in the future, but in you know 20 years or so. And if we do that, it won't matter about cutting our emissions and doing future carbon capture or anything. We're, we're just stuck. So we actually, it's like fighting a war. You don't just say, well, tanks are more efficient than than ships. So let's just build tanks until we built all the tanks and then we'll build the ships. No, you build everything all at once and that's how you win the war. Right, but tanks and ships are both valuable and they both serve valuable purposes. Um, let's. This is the single most important point in my, okay. in, in my mind. So let's spend a little bit of time on it because the literature is pretty clear on this. Um, right. The... Um, once you say it is much, much more efficient to not put CO2 in the air than mm -hmm. it is to pull it out, mm -hmm. you are effectively creating a cost curve. Mm -hmm. One of those is going to be very inefficient and therefore much higher cost of per CO2 of ton that you pull out of the air. Now, a ton that you pull out of the air is equal Unto a ton you put into the air. That's correct. Right. So what is the fastest way to reduce emissions? The fastest way to reduce emissions is going to be to do all the efficient stuff first because we don't have an infinite amount of money and we don't have an infinite amount of renewables. Right. So so you're saying there is a fixed budget. There's something we don't know maybe what it, but it's there's a fixed budget 
for saving civilization. Correct. Right. Clearly there is. There right. is? Okay, I didn't realize Are that. we spending yeah. an infinite amount of money right now? Are We're not we doing only... anything. We're not doing anything right now. Right. But whenever we, whatever <laughs> we do, we don't have an infinite amount of money and infinite amount of renewables. We're going to do something. So, so you're saying, to be clear, if we build a DAC system, and by the way, we're when we say we have to build DAC systems now, it's not because they're going to reduce a lot of emissions now. It's because we need them to reduce a lot of past emissions and therefore it's going to take time to scale up. So we better do it now because if we try to do it later, we're, we're totally screwed as I mentioned earlier, but, but instead of, but so I think what you're saying is when you build a DAC system, you're not building some amount of wind and solar. Is that fair? No, I'm saying, I'm saying instead you're, you're when you trade -off. build a DAC system mm -hmm. and devote the renewable energy to the DAC system and you vote all the, uh, uh, devote all of the resources and the pipelines and all of that stuff. Yeah. Right. Um, but that comes to a very high price per CO2. And in fact, you mentioned Climeworks, right? Mm -hmm. And Climeworks is about, um, oh, am I live or not? Yeah, you're frozen, but you're, we can hear you. So um, okay. <laughs> uh, Climeworks is about 600 to to $1,000 a ton. And as you know, right. back in, in, in a conference, in June, that the CEO of, uh, that was run by Climeworks on direct mm -hmm. air capture, this co-CEO, co-founder said uh, he wasn't sure they could get it below 300 a ton. So I mm -hmm. want people to understand that this may, it, it's possible it could get substantially below that, but there are a lot of people who are skeptical. Um, mm -hmm. Now, so the point is, what you have is, am I going to spend a substantial amount of money now Mm -hmm. on something that is a very expensive, inefficient way to deal with CO2 before I've done the cheap and efficient stuff at scale? And the answer in the literature is no. <laughs> you would do, until you have made the electric grid virtually carbon-free, right, it doesn't make sense to use renewables to run a DAC system when you should be using the renewables to not to shut down fossil fuel systems. And, well, yeah. maybe we stop there because that's a very important statement. It is, um, and I would I would say the following: CO two levels are already too high. Reducing emissions, reducing the bad thing we're doing. Uh, by the way, if you reduce emissions by ninety percent, you will only be decreasing the increase in cumulative emissions by one and a half percent because we already put out two point four trillion tons and as you said what whether you count fossil fuels or everything we're doing it's 40 to 50 gigatons of emissions which is a tiny tiny amount compared to the total and so since our problem is the total and yes we're making it worse every year we have to stop doing that but if we don't also reduce the total which reducing emissions has no impact I think you'll agree. No impact on our past emissions, right? But neither does direct air capture. Uh, no, what it do you doesn't. Mean? It's because we've just agreed that a ton of direct air capture is equal to a ton of uh, emitted emissions by a coal plant. There's no difference between the CO two. No, 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 no. I agree with that. But right. So the atmosphere doesn't. If you don't have, if you the don't have... distinguish the atmosphere doesn't distinguish. You, you can't pull out any of the old tons until you stopped putting in new tons, right? Because all the tons are the same. You're drawing a line around some imaginary old tons, but the atmosphere doesn't recognize the difference between the old tons and the new tons. And until you get the new tons down to near zero, all that you're doing by pulling out tons with DAX is competing with the people who could pull up, stop the tons that we're putting in now. Right. That's what, that's your claim. No, no, that's, no. That's the literature. I'll read you. The oh, well, the literature. The, the literature. Yeah. Only but it, it, no, 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 Stacey, I want to, I want to cover this here. Only, so. this is a 2021 analysis. Uh, only, yeah. Yeah. But let's, only let's when, only, well, let me finish. Only when the region's electricity system is nearly completely decarbonized, do the opportunity cost of dedicating a low carbon electricity source to DAC disappear. So what we are talking about here is the opportunity cost, the single thing that is omitted from the vast majority of analyses of what is a good idea to do right now.
Correct. It's the opportunity cost. Yeah. I agree. If there's a one-to-one trade-off, if if every time I build a DAC system, I'm not I'm either using the renewables of or or stopping the building of whatever, uh, then you will get more reduction. I, I I'm agreeing with you. Okay. You'll get more reduction by following the path of um of going renewables. Let's call it emissions reduction only. Maybe yeah. that's a fair way to call it. However, and this is a not just an an unfortunate situation, that path of emissions reduction only leads to catastrophe. Let me ask you the question. Let's say we do what you're saying. Let's follow, and Michael Mann says, we follow the path of emissions reduction only. Someday, and let's say we're successful at it, and let's say we're being optimistic about it even, like, oh, yeah, yeah, we finally, yeah, because we're not really doing it as trying. fast as we we're could now. We're not really trying very hard. We're not trying very hard. But let's say we try hard, we do it. What temperature do we reach when we finally get to zero emissions following that path of emissions reduction only? Like what? Well, what the we answer get? is it's a lower temperature than the path that you described because I'm doing the no, most, I'm, I'm using understand. the resources most efficiently to take emissions down as quickly okay. as possible. So, so I, I, the only thing I would say, Joe, it, and I am not a climate scientist, but, um, I, I think that you're thinking in a, it is a zero sum game. There is a pie, it cannot be expanded. That um, whatever we have to spend, any efforts yeah. that we have, they that is it. And it is, if you take- No, no, from, no, that's not what I'm thinking. Okay. Uh, I'm thinking that whatever amount of money and renewables we can spend, whatever that amount is, all of it has to go into reducing emissions until we get emissions so low that it would make that that the that the uh, let's put it another way. Let's say the DAC is three hundred a ton and emissions reductions is fifty a ton. Okay, if you tell me that I should spend money at three hundred dollars a ton to pull CO two out of the air when I could also spend. Uh, $50 a ton or $30 a ton to simply not put it there in the first place, then I'm going to tell you that for the same amount of resources that you're going to spend on your thing, I can get 10 times the CO2 reduction impact, which is equivalent because those tons are the same. And the question is, when will it make sense to do the really expensive stuff? And the answer is... After I've done the cheap, most ninety percent of the cheap fu- stuff first, and that's what the literature is very clear on. So this but, isn't a zero sum game. This is how am I going to spend my resources and a renewable energy for the next three decades? No, but that is, but that's a zero sum game. I mean, that you are just you are describing a zero sum game. Describing a zero sum game. You tell me how what the sum is, and it will still always be better to spend whatever amount of money and resources you have. On the cheaper stuff first, but you're not. But you're not. The, you you need to take this farther, though. If it's true what you're saying, it is. Then forget DAC. Let's look at cruise ships. Let's look at golf carts. Let's look at Tupperware. Let's look at everything that doesn't reduce emissions and say, well, wait a second. I could spend it on golf clubs, or that same money could go to renewable energy. Why are you picking DAC? DAC's the last thing you should pick on your list of things you're going to trade off in terms of money and resources for say, because getting back to my original point, the plan that you're describing, and I'm not arguing with your numbers, if, if it is a zero sum game, ends in catastrophe. It, it, it fails. But your plan also ends in catastrophe because- No, it doesn't. It's done for two reasons. One is, again, I'm scaling up DAC so that I can have Four, not three gigatons, 40 gigatons. Yeah, you're um, never going to. Wh- but I'll describe how we get there later. But no, the other thing I'm also that, doing. That's silly. That's silly. I'm sorry. This is no, silly. No, no. Okay, okay. This is just silly. Well, but the other I, thing, I, I, forget forget, uh, forget uh, what I'm saying. Uh, let's just take what Jim Hansen says in the last, in his pipeline paper. He also says we have to immediately reduce the earth energy imbalance that's going on right now. 
And he says that, uh, and we have I to agree. essentially use solar radi uh, sunlight reflection methods or solar radiation management. So you're, you're, you're okay with that? I'm agreeing that we should be desperate right now, and we should be doing a lot of things we're not doing. Right. Oh, but, right. We, we both agree. Right. <laughs> you can't no wave a that. magic wand and pretend that we're in a different situation today than we're in. The situation that we are in today is that we have to go as quickly to reduce the heat imbalance in the world. And the fastest way to reduce the heat imbalance, the fastest way and the cheapest way, is to stop putting CO2 into mm, not, the air in the first no, place. No, that's not it's solar radiation management. It's the fastest Well, that's a different matter, way. which we're not talking about here. Oh, okay, I'm no, but that is the fastest about. and cheapest way. I think. I'm, it's not clear. Agree. That hasn't been proven yet. You're just making an assertion that it is. It's never been tested well, at scale. It's oh, not a commercial product. Well, it actually has. It's called no, a, a, not what Mount, we're Mount Pinatubo. Mount Pinatubo is a... Right, but that's not what we do. Are we going to yeah. set off a volcano? No, we'll right. Do no, we're going to do something different, and what yeah, is yeah, the yeah. impact of that? But I'm not here to debate solar radiation. Okay, yet. let's keep it on this one. Very different matter. Okay. Sorry, but, can I can I just but, um I, Joe? Because I, I there's a lot of similarities here. We are I, like I I and and the algorithms listen. And when I pulled up to post this on LinkedIn, I see Jennifer Granholm out here in Tracy at a carbon at heirloom and whatever. And I um have what the the this ridiculous fascination with hydrogen. Like, I feel like my state is being overtaken by these, like, wh why don't we just do the other thing? I get, I get what you're saying. I do. I want, um, I want all the reju reductions to happen. I'm the bike person. I'm, if you must drive, it would be an EV, but please let's all just take transit. Right. Like I, I get, I am, I am with you. I just, at the same time, <laughs> I, if we don't start doing some of this, you know, this isn't like, um, a, uh, a, you know, I use the weight loss metaphor, you know, it's like you go, go in for a lap band surgery or whatever, before you decide to like, maybe not have three Big Macs a day, you know, like the, why, why are you doing that? Um, in, instead of just not, you know, making it happen in the first place and you actually can lose weight if you just eat less and move more. Like, like we can't get rid of carbon. Like everything that's been spent is there forever. It will like essentially, and we can't make it go away, even though we want all the reductions to happen. We want to get to net zero and we aren't even lifting a freaking finger to get there and actually make that happen. We would, even if we did it all, okay, Stacy, I want to. I'm, I'm, I'm landing it. Even if we did it all, if we if we made everything stop today and no more emissions happen, we still have that. Up there. Right. So that's and what we, we have to figure out how to get it out. Sure. And no you know question we're not about doing it. Anything. We have to figure it out. The, mm -hmm. I don't have any R and D. I'm a very big fan of, and we should be doing a lot of R and D. But we're not going to get to the point where it makes sense to scale up until we're near eliminated all fossil fuel emissions. Well, and that's okay. Just okay. Wait, no, no, wait, wait, no, Eli, Eli, wait, wait, wait. Let's let's keep this between Joe and I. This is not um, just. We're going to have time for questions and interaction, and you guys will do that first. But it's too confusing <laughs> to to hop around, and 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 even when we get to the Q and A, let's do it one at a time. So Joe can respond to one person and not, and not be like triple teamed and things like that. So, so let's get back uh, to we. The plan is, uh, first of all, hundred percent agree to get down to zero emissions as quickly as possible. However, my point is, you are comparing it to DAC. You have a zero sum game on DAC, but why DAC? DAC is. A good thing, which you'll agree, I think, that it might be ineffectual and maybe more expensive, but the net of it does reduce atmospheric CO2, even at a high cost. But there is are thousands, millions, billions of other things we spend money on that don't actually increase atmospheric CO2 instead of decrease it or at least do nothing. I gave you some examples, you know, cruise ships and right, apartment but, but buildings. But we're not going to, are you, how are you going to stop people from doing, I don't want to stop. I don't, are you telling me we're going to change human behavior? No, no, no. I'm saying that we're trying to solve an existential crisis. It won't, but you know, by the way, as uh, 
their their behavior is changing now and going to change a lot more, not because of choice, but because of, you know, <laughs> things hitting the fan, right? They are starting to do. Taylor Swift canceled her Rio concert because Rio's temperatures were the highest they've ever been. And it was too dangerous to have the concert 58, what some crazy I, I, heat index of 58C or something crazy like that. So uh, so this is happening already. We don't have to wait for that. That's it's happening. My question is, however, if the plan, and this is you're describing a plan to reduce our emissions as quickly as possible, that doesn't do anything about removing the 2.4 trillion tons. In fact, I would argue it doesn't actually no, nor does DAC. Um if DAC, DAC is, is you not... if you're scaling DAC, if you're scaling DAC in order to have it be higher than the emissions as you scale down the emissions, right? That will be a crossing point at some point. Then you are building, you're building the system now to actually reduce atmospheric CO2. Right, and and in the fine. meantime, I would argue you're using SRM to keep us alive while we do those two I, I, things. I think it'll it's... take a very long time, by the way. I don't, I'm, I'm not saying you do DAC, you know, it's going to take, it's going to take 30 years to scale down emissions. It's going to take 30 years to scale up DAC, of course. I, I agree. So I think we're basically in agreement here. It's going to be 30 years before it makes a lot of, at least 30 years before it makes a lot of sense to scale up DAC. I'm not no, no, it. no, no, because, all right. So today, as you mentioned, Climeworks, Climeworks is fourth, the first one is 4,000 tons um, a year. That's called kiloton scale, right? By kind of definition, right? It's kiloton scale. Um, and we need to be at like 40 gigatons, well, <laughs> I, I would say. Maybe you can, uh, did, uh, did we'll you get to net zero. Know? We'll get to net zero in a moment, by the way, because does net zero make sense? But uh, that's a million times more, one million X. Indeed. And, you, and it's uh, Swanson's law or whatever. You know, every doubling of volume, you get a 20% savings on, on something that you make. And uh, uh, no, so, that depends on the thing you make. Of course, but solar did that uh, better. better right, but the so, there's yeah. been studies on certain things. That is the solar happen. law, I think, by the way. <laughs> right, but it's not the law of cars. It's not the law of natural gas plants. It's not the law of coal plants. It, it actually coal. is the law of, of, of cars and things, because that's what's happening to EVs. But EVs are a new type of car. The old cars, they had all their doublings already. There, there's no more doublings of the volume of cars, right? In fact, they're going to start of regular cars. They're going to drop now, actually. It's going to go reverse. But EVs, as they are doubling, they are following a, 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 a dramatic cost curve, right? They were $100,000 um, $100, 10 years ago. They're 30, 35000 today, you know, and, and so they're, they're following that cost curve to some degree. Uh, and nuclear power plants are in the opposite direction because you build a custom nuclear power plant every time. But I think if we're going to get into gigaton scale for DAC, we're going to make something like a solar panel, which will be a shipping container. That DAC does... is a is a very complicated system, so it's got it's it is so going to be a car. It is going to be one offs for a long time. Because... Well, for now, because we're figuring out how to make them, of course. But, but you uh... need you, it's not just you have to figure out how to make them. If you're going to do them at scale, you're going to have to figure out how to site them near a, a huge uh, place where there's a lot of renewables. Absolutely. You're going to have to figure out how to run a pipeline from where you are to where the storage is, right? Which will be local, of course. Hopefully. Well, it, it, why wouldn't you do it that way? I mean, that uh, seems kind of obvious. Maybe that location doesn't have enough water, doesn't have enough infrastructure, doesn't have enough people around. I mean, are you going to do it in the middle of nowhere? No, you're not going to do it in the middle of nowhere. You got so. But I, I think we can agree a gigaton scale. They're not going to be custom units. I mean, giga, you're talking about gigaton. And by the way, I'll give you some numbers that I've worked out myself. To do 40 gigatons a year, which sounds crazy, you need uh, 110 million one ton a day net systems, the size of a shipping container. If you go to talk to Klaus Lackner, he thinks that's very doable. His original. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, moisture swing system was kind of configured that way. So uh, uh, you can fit a, a ton a day uh, system in a shipping container. You need 110 million. It sounds like a lot, but let's say you build them over 10 years. So that's 11 million a year. And you say, well, wait, that still sounds like a lot. Can we build 11 million of something a year? Well, we build 90 million cars a year. <laughs> so we're talking about something the size of the automobile industry, which I admit is huge it's an enormous thing but we also built the oil industry which is also huge right huge. but but like i said you the 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 you still have two 
it, you know, staggering problems to solve. Like I said, at 3 billion tons, you're moving a flow of CO2, which is 90 to 100 million barrels of oil a day, right? You can't just multiply But, but you're not you're not flowing. And that's, that would be if it was CCS. If it was CCS, I would agree. You, you, you have your plants wherever they are, your cement plant, your steel plant. You got to flow all that CO2 somewhere. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about capturing CO2 out of the air and sticking it right in the ground where you are, either basalt or deep well injection or whatever. That well, you should, you should look at the literature because the reality is you're going to have to build these things where there is a vast amount of renewable resources that haven't been tapped yet, right? So you have to find the places on the earth where there is a huge amount of solar or wind that hasn't been tapped yet. Correct. Right? You need Absolutely. new renewables, right? So there aren't a lot of those places, right? Really? They're deserts, right? There's high insulation places and high wind places, right? Well, we're going to mm-hmm. snap up all the good ones to just get off of coal and oil and natural gas, right? You, you, you can't just wave your hand and say it's easy to cite these. These are going to be very tricky to cite because you're not only going to have to find a place that has a lot of as yet untapped cost effective renewables, you are going to have to find it near a place that is also a certified becomes a certified geologic repository. Right. And um, so well, there this- are very few of those now because there's no reason to have them. Right. I mean, they're, they're obviously public- we're going to get better doing that as we scale it up. Right. So, I mean, right. But again, like I said, yes, it's true. Someone makes a point. There's plenty of wind in the Midwest. We are using the wind in the Midwest now to, to in order to displace coal. Right. And we're going to be using up. Uh, like I said, this is a staggering amount of renewable electricity you're talking about. I and mean, if you were growing oh, up, I, Ford, I mean, you know, at, at, at like I said, one tenth, one tenth of a gigaton. By the way, when you say that, it's just I want to be clear because th- th- I think this is important. When you say it's that amount of electricity, you are assuming that the renewable energy is running the whole capture system, right? You're not just talking about the balance of plant and the fans. You're talking about the capture system itself. It's it's running the vast majority of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I don't believe that's going to ever be true. I mean, you could then true. argue that trees aren't possible because they would use too much energy. They don't use man-made electricity. They use sunlight and, you know, photosynthesis. And, but and trees are also incredibly inefficient. That's what their problem is. Yeah, two percent exactly. Right. But they seem right. to be. There seems to be quite a few like because right, that's they're a natural system, and we're trying to, and and they take a really long time to grow, right? But but natural it's, systems use what I call I it's my phrase earth energy to distinguish it from man made electricity, and the, most of the direct air capture systems I have seen so far, by the way, whether they're mechanical tree type systems we're talking about or, or weathering system uh, mineral weathering systems or whatever they might be or ocean fertilization systems um which we haven't talked about by the way uh these all use some form of earth energy you do something i mean you are you know you're initializing something or you're using some electricity for some of the things but the capture process which is the energy intensive thing because that's you know, 0.04%, whatever. That's usually using some kind of free earth energy. It may be free. It's not always free because well, you have to drill a well, not, but, right. but you and know. that's a whole different set of systems than direct air capture. No, no, like, no. I'm talking, no, I'm talking about Climeworks. Okay. Climeworks doesn't Climeworks. use, it doesn't use a lot Climeworks of man-made is staggeringly energy efficient, inefficient. It uses a staggering amount of energy. It's correct. The, but it's 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 energy that you can find for free after you drill a well anywhere on Earth, 120 uh, degrees C, uh, heat. Uh, uh, it's not it's okay. not 350 where it's very rare to find it, like California, yeah, where you have volcanoes basically, right? You know, Iceland and California and a few other places. That's where the current. Um, hold on. Um, turn off your videos if you're on there. I didn't uh, realize, David. Please turn off your video. And uh, let me see if I uh, turn off that so they can't do that. Um, so, first of all, absolutely true that it's staggering. But by the way, growing trees takes a staggering amount of energy. There's no question about it. But there's a difference nope, nope. between the energy we must create using our own resources versus energy that the Earth will provide us for free. Sunlight. I mean, solar, you could say, well, solar uses a staggering amount of energy. 
Well, yeah, <laughs> it's sunlight. That's what we want. It's free. It keeps coming. Uh, geothermal is another form of energy. Moisture is another. Uh, water is another form. And dry air is an, uh, or cool air is another form of Earth energy that all these, is, well, they all work differently. Not, but... not in scalable amounts to run a system like Climeworks. I mean, a, the, like geothermal, said, geothermal, why not? The, again, the geothermal is a very limited energy right now. Could could it be? It, it, it absolutely is. But but that's because you um, are we're trying to get 350 degrees Celsius geothermal, which is very rare, hard to find, very expensive to get. 120 degrees is available almost everywhere on Earth without drilling too far, right? And there are new technologies for drilling wells more cheaply. That the big, big revolution in geothermal are two things. One, how to drill cheaper. And two, how to utilize a smaller temperature differential. Uh, like Cornell is using uh, a geothermal well to heat their buildings, which sounds crazy because Cornell is not a place where you would ever expect to right, find any useful... Aware... In, in the Climeworks system, the energy is involved in creating the sorbents, right? That's currently the problem there. That's you mean the manufacturing of the sorbents? Yes. That's where the staggering amount of energy is right now. Um, well, but sure. we're getting very but, they, but they, they last long. But by the way, let's, let's shift it all around because I want to get to the highest level uh, of this issue because maybe we're dancing around something here because I, you know, I agree with you. I, I agree with you that DAC is very, call it just very energy inefficient, inefficient compared to reducing our emissions. Totally agree. I also totally agree that we have to get our emissions down to zero or as close to zero as fast as humanly possible. And we'll probably both agree that we're not even close to even not trying, even try. let not alone good. doing. Yeah. So um, so we'll, we'll agree on that. But uh, I'll just say it a, a different way. I think to survive, <laughs> to to come out of this on the other side with a functioning civilization, that we need to do three things. One is absolutely number one, which you were talking about, hundred percent agree, no argument. Okay. Second thing, we have to remove the CO two we've already put up there in order to get back to a safe level of CO two, which, as Jim Hansen put it, is you know probably the maximum safe level is. 350 parts per million, but maybe it's, you know, 280, but, you know, it's somewhere in between there. And I've heard some good news that the oceans will actually not spit back all of the CO2 in a, in a timely manner that it took in. Some of it will stay deep in the oceans and take longer to come back into the atmosphere. So maybe it gives us some leeway on having to only remove one and a half trillion tons instead of two and a half trillion tons, which, uh, I don't know, still obviously a big problem. But that's number two. And number three is solar radiation management while we do the first two. But we can't rely on that forever because if it ever stops, you know, boy, you're screwed pretty fast, as, as everybody knows. And we're seeing that now as we clean up our pollution. Because as we do number one, as we, re as we do uh, reducing our emissions as soon as humanly possible, we are going to get the termination shock that we're already starting to see. And, and temperatures are going to go way beyond two degrees. And let me just ask you that. I think, and Hansen agrees, we're going to go over two degrees if we follow the emissions reduction only approach. Do you agree with that or disagree I, with I that? think you're phrasing it wrong. We're going to go, we're probably going to go on the basis of the, uh, I mean, you can go to the, to the carbon action tracker and mm -hmm. look at what the plans of the top 20 countries in the world are, right? And and of those 20 countries, 19 of them are not do not have policies and actions in place that will keep us below 2 degrees Celsius. And many of them don't have policies and actions in place that would keep us below 3 degrees Celsius. And exactly one country of those 20 does have some policies and actions in place that would keep us below 2 degrees Celsius. And that's number 12, which is mm -hmm. Germany. Right. So okay. we are we are a very long way from uh, uh, keeping warming to any safe level. Right. There's no question about that. Um, and um, but it doesn't matter whether we do direct air capture or not, uh, uh, because it's just this is what we're doing now. Right. What we're doing. Well, now well I think I think we can all agree that based on what we're doing now, we're totally screwed. I mean, we're not doing anything serious. Uh, you know, right. globally, nationally. I mean, 
you could argue Denmark's doing a lot. You, know, you can argue some individual there's, there's countries are, very, yeah, are, are so, doing yeah, some good things. Small countries. And, uh, smaller countries and whatever. And you could argue the EU has a good, nice uh, emissions trading scheme, whatever. You can do things like that. But as a globe, we're not, none of, none, of, none of what we're talking about today matters in a sense from if all we're going to look at is continuing the path we're on because the path we're on is not one to do anything, really. I mean, it's to sl slow down how bad we're making it, I guess is the best way to put it. But someday, and I think that day will come soon, only, by the way, not because you and I have been talking about this stuff for 20 years or more, but because the shit's hitting the fan and uh, the Taylor Swift's canceling her concert and Dubai, which has the cop coming up in a few weeks, is has streets that are flooded and cars floating down the middle of the street. Um, and that's happening everywhere. And, there, and we can go on about all the impacts. So impacts are going to grow. And then the public, hopefully, will then demand, which they're not doing now, demand action. So I think we have to assume, by the way, for your thing to work or anything to work, that there will be um, increased policy to fight climate change because the policy we have One today, hopes so yes I well i mean we have to assume it because without it it doesn't really we, we can just talk all well i don't i don't I, I don't assume things i i i recommend things and i hope <laughs> me too to me, but i don't you know uh the events of the last 15 or 20 years do not lead me to believe that that there's going to be a sudden change in the the direction of the human uh, uh, emissions trajectory, but look uh, again. I, like I, I said, do actually, and 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 I'm in the same boat you're in, right? I've been calling for this stuff for so long with no no response, and you you more than me even. But the one thing I will say that is different that I have noticed in the last few years is the thing that has changed the discussion from no talk really, except among the clamorati kind of thing, to the public talking about it is the damage that they can view and they know is climate change. That's going to get a lot worse very quickly. So my belief is, since the only thing that <laughs> changes public discourse is the the damage, uh, it will change because we're going to see so much more. And that should well, trigger it, it, policy look, changes. I, I think the main statement that I'm sure we both agree on is that if the world ever got serious, I mean, or I should say desperate, because we ought to be, we should be <laughs> desperate around now. I've certainly Correct. 15 years ago thought that we would be desperate in the 2020s. And, and it, whenever we get desperate, take a World War II style, World War II a scale effort. Correct. Yes, we could we could hit any target that we hadn't already, you know, passed by. And and whether we could come back, well, let's not get into that. But I, I think if we get desperate, uh uh we have the technologies, you know, we we know what we should be doing. We electrify, you know, we as much renewables as possible, electrify as much as you can, and that takes you a very far way, right? Heat pumps will take out of the natural gas heating and electric vehicles and such will take out the the vast amount of oil and you have other things but the point is you know we, we could spend the next 20 years radically d reducing emissions using existing technology and it would be good for the planet it would be cost effective it would have many other side benefits so i think we no, both... no, I, I agree with that i, I uh, but I, I also I, don't think it would stop an amok collapse and i don't think it would Stop no, going no, I'm not saying that, that I'm not I'm not saying that that would be enough. I'm just saying that look, we're we're very far okay. from going negative, right? I mean, I don't I don't spend a lot of time trying to imagine at what point in the future the world is not only going to get to zero, but it's going to get substantially below zero. I, I I'd like to see us getting us the I'd like to see the majority of the nations of the world on a path to actually get to zero by mid-century, right? When that happens, yeah. then we could have a long discussion of how do we do even better than that, right? But we're not close to that. If you want to imagine some future where we're 10 times better than that, you know, that's fine. But I'm just here in the real world. And I say, if you're asking me, what should we do right now? How should we switch our policy? The mm -hmm. most important thing is to take the money and renewables that we are going to build, whatever that amount is, and first we drive down emissions. And actually, so I would actually disagree. I think the number one policy is not to increase renewables because we've been doing that. It hasn't reduced fossil fuels. The number one policy is to phase out fossil fuels. That will create 
a lot of renewables, of course, but then it will be direct replacement rather than adding to our energy supply. So, so well, far, all renewables but, have just added to energy supply. Yeah, but I, I don't disagree with that, but but nobody is, no one in the planet has a policy to- I agree with that. <laughs> to, I mean, nobody has a plan- By the way, no one has a policy to do anything that's going to be no, 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 there are a lot of countries that have a policy to ramp up renewables. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's there, true. there are no countries that have a policy to phase out uh, fossil fuels. Well, there there are some no, in the cars. No, I mean, the not car in thing. the top 20 emitters. Um, well, California is, is, is uh, has a 20, 35, some European nations. So, I mean, there's some, I no, call no, them I'm little not, hints and signs here. of it, but but not. Uh, I'm not I interested agree with in, their, in their stated. Well, no, uh, the ice car thing, getting rid of ice cars. No, no, I, banning I, them. All, I'm interested yeah. in, in, in policies and actions in place. Because pe people, well, don't, don't, okay. But let by the way, uh, I could talk to you forever about this, but let let I want to cover the other part of your paper, which is net zero is a dangerous myth. Can you just give us a few minutes on why net? Uh, first, I'll just say again, very briefly, a sentence or two. What is net zero for people joining later, um, and why is net zero a dangerous myth? Well, uh, and and I think the simplest way to see it is that. Um, it gets back to our main our main debate. Um, we uh, the most you know um, net zero is the notion that instead of going down from fifty billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions today to zero, we only have to go down from fifty billion tons um, to let's say forty, and we'll do the other ten with uh, negative emissions technologies. And, you know, I have these two papers on the website of, of the, um, you know, Center for Science, Sustainability and the Media at the University of Pennsylvania. I can I should drop that actually into the chat so people can read the yeah. papers because that will um, uh, take us a lot. You know, people who want who want to see more of the the literature that I'm referring to. Um, it, I did, uh, by the way, on on the uh, YouTube comment section, I did put a link to your uh your page of, of documents so they can everyone can access all of them that are on your uh, right. pen pen page yeah um and yeah, i think it's and i will page. yeah there it is i put it into the meeting group chat um so uh uh there is this myth that we don't have to aggressively reduce emissions now because the 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 cavalry will come in with the negative emissions in the future and solve that problem and mm -hmm. um and uh whatever amount of negative emissions we're going to have in 2050 um we better not be um misled into thinking that we could take our foot off the gas of emissions reductions Right. That right. You, you, and, and, and here I think we're in, in, in great agreement that you, you certainly uh, uh, would not want people to go around thinking that whatever we're going to do in the direct air capture is any reason sh should be used as a justification not to do as much emissions reduction as possible. And absolutely agree. And, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, we have all these models in the, in the you know, these integrated assessment models, all the models that people use to figure out what the emissions pathway is going to be, and therefore how aggressive we have to be now. And a lot of them are overshoot models. Right. Correct. Well, now that's the only thing left. Um, and <laughs> I mean, for staying well, under two, for example, the only right, thing no, left is I, overshoot I, models. Right. And I, I, um, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't ultimately try to come back from the overshoot. I just don't want people thinking again that it's an excuse not Absolutely. to be as aggressive as uh, possible at reducing emissions. So I, I, and that's why I call it a myth. I mean, if you go to... So you're not saying, by the way, just to be super clear, because they're just saying that it's a myth, people could think you think getting to zero is not possible. What you're saying is... The framing of net zero to use future carbon reductions as, as an allowance for doing more emissions today. That's the myth part. That's the right. thing that In future the, the myth is that is that is that future carbon removal is saves us the trouble from doing the aggressive emissions reductions today. And this, and by the way, follows what uh, um 
uh, Kevin and climate scientist Kevin Anderson, we've interviewed on here. That's that's his position as well. But I want to ask you a question about that. Yeah. Let's say carbon DAC did not exist. It wasn't, it, you know, no, it never was invented. No one ever thought about it. Do you think there would be more emissions reductions happening now? Or do you think that the powers that be, the fossil fuel industries that own the politicians would find some other convenient excuse to keep doing what they're doing? Well, um, we both know the fossil fuel industries have spent a staggering amount of money to dissuade us from taking the kind of action that you and I would both like to take. Whether it's a price on carbon, you go back to the, you know, what Obama tried to do, right? Fossil fuel industries helped kill that. The House passed the Waxman-Markey bill, right? And then the fossil fuel company said, oh, we didn't think that was going to happen. We better start mm -hmm. spending staggering amounts of money to get people to call into the Senate and say this is the worst idea, you know, known to humankind. And right. um, so in the fossil fuel companies support, uh, you know, politicians uh, to, you know, to thwart uh, action. As you know, the fossil fuel companies create lots of front groups to persuade people that there's something wrong with wind power or offshore wind or all that stuff, right? So there's, or electric vehicles, right? So there's a staggering amount of money mm -hmm. that's put out there to, to undermine action, right? Um, you know, uh, can I wave a, wave a magic wand and make the fossil fuel companies stop doing that? Uh, obviously not. Well, no, but you're making the argument that uh, that DAC is a moral hazard, I think is the way it's framed, in that we're using the potential for future use of DAC as an excuse for continued fossil fuel use. And if for that to be true, it would have to be true that if you got rid of DAC, if DAC didn't exist, or you, I don't know, agreed not to do in the future, whatever, that that would lower emissions faster. I don't, um, think that's, no, I don't think that's I, I true. Don't, I, I, don't I could think, be wrong, but I don't think that's true. Um, well, I think that, it, you know, again, we can't separate this from the disinformation campaign. I think if everybody in the world understood that uh, negative emissions technologies aren't something that should be relied upon, and in fact, it would be dangerous to do so, that the world would be more motivated to do what has to be done now. The but, but wait, 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 wait. First of all, the vast majority of the world doesn't even know what the phrase negative emission technology even means. Well, no, and people, I would argue that the, the vast the majority have no clue how dangerous climate change is. Right. No, I'm alone. talking about the people who make policy. Most oh, policies. The, okay. Right. But the, 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 the people, look, you and I can't solve. I still maybe argue the same, by the way, that they well, don't, they certainly don't know how dangerous climate change is. No, I, I would agree. I still think that it's, it's true that, that the, oh, I mean, look, I listened to, you know, like uh, the Pivot podcast with with uh, Kara Swisher and and uh, Scott Galloway, which is the top tech podcast in the world. And I heard them talking about climate change and they don't have a clue. They don't. Uh, well, I was once speaking with Steny Hoyer, who's the number two Democrat in the House of Representatives. This is a, quite a while ago, but he was still the number two guy back then. He's the, the whip. And uh, I, I was at an event where I got to speak for like three minutes. And of course, I spent my time talking about climate change. And I mentioned, I said, the number one thing I think people should know about climate change that they don't know is that CO2 is unlike other kinds of pollution that go away after you stop doing them. It stays in the atmosphere for hundreds of thousands of years, you know, and I said, that's why we have to act right away. He came up to me after, because Dan, I said, that's interesting. I didn't know that. <laughs> and it really made me feel bad because well, this is about our and, top and this is leaders don't know the basics of the, not not the details of climate science, the most important aspects of it, of the nature of the problem we're trying to face, right? The nature well, of this it. is this is that look, I think people do need to understand, and this is, you know, that that that, that yes, climate change is very different from other environmental problems because look, you you Denver has bad air pollution, it gets really bad, people spend 10 years, or LA and it gets cleaner or the Hudson River, where I grew up, you would never want to swim in, but you try for 10 years, you clean it up and you can swim in it now, right? That is obviously can't happen be, uh, in, in the case of climate change because the systems involved are very slow and 90 plus percent of the heat goes into the oceans, right? So, mm -hmm. and, 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 and you have uh, the glaciers, once they start melting, right? It's very hard to stop some things once you start them. So yes, climate change, is 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 very different than other issues and people don't understand that and the point that you're making 
which has to, is a so-called, you know, bathtub analogy, right? People don't get the difference between the flow of water in out of the faucet and the amount in the tub, right? Well, you know, we, we have a certain level of water in the tub and it keeps going up and up, but stopping it from going up and up doesn't solve our problem, right? We have to bring it down, right? So we- we Well, we that's, to- that's the nature of our discussion here today. I'm saying- that yes, uh, you want to turn the faucet down as fast as possible. 100% agree with that. Uh, you're saying that to the extent we work on increasing the size of the drain, uh, we're taking t- uh, money or resources or we're not turning the faucet as fast off as we could. I think that's right. maybe a good analogy. We're good talking about. It, yeah. and, I, and I'm saying that's not how you think. That's not how you act in World War II or World War III, whatever it might be. If you need tanks, how many tanks you need? You're getting them all. How many ships you need? You're getting them all. And what you take away from is not the things you use to fight the war. You take away, you don't make any more civilian cars. You don't make any more civilian planes. Oh, right, you, right. You, you turn off all the lights. You know, you you, you have blackouts. You have, right. you, you okay, take it right. seriously. Right. And yeah. because, yeah. and I right. think this is the key point here, the plan of emissions reduction only, and I think you agree, I think you agree, you're you're saying it might be our best plan, but it's still going to fail in the sense that we're going we're going over two degrees, guys. I mean, hold on to your hats. And and as Hansen points out in a previous paper, that's catastrophe. People have people. It's our it's our goal, but it's it's a terrible goal because we're you know it's going to destroy life as we know it. But there are things we could do if it were serious, fighting it like a war, where we give all the resources to renewables and at Right. By the way, phase out fossil fuels and let industry figure out how to fill them in rather than hoping that they drop by building an alternative. You know, there's that that kind of thing. I'm a very big, I, you know, certainly think that the only way climate change gets solved is if we get to the World War II mentality. Um, By the way, I agree with you, too. And that's why we're having this discussion, because I think if, if, if we're not talking that way, nothing you and I are talking about today would have any impact really right if we're only going to go the way we're going i mean you know all i what i would say is yeah in 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 a perfect world we would do i i won't there's no world in which you can do everything and we we certainly didn't build an infinite amount of tanks right what whatever we did was constrained by uh, the manufacturing capability by the money that we could spend and we didn't have an infinite amount of money to spend we didn't have an infinite number of people Right. I mean, we shipped we had to bring women into the workforce. My mother was a Rosie the Riveter, in fact. Um, but he, you know, what I would say again is the following. It I want to draw a distinction between making investments at the scale of billions, possibly 10 billion, maybe more, uh, to develop technologies that we might need uh to be able to scale around, let's say, 2050. Um, but pouring the trillions into the actual, you know, removal, you know, reduction of existing emissions technologies. That's the scale at which I'm talking about. And those numbers change over time, for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, If we, you know, as something approaches um, cost effectiveness, um, um, but, you know, we are in a world, and I think this is important for people to understand, you know, um, it is true that if you put money into direct air capture, you you um, potentially um, are going to lower the price of direct air capture. But you're, we're still at the same time lowering the price of batteries, electric cars, solar and wind. Yeah, that's happening incredibly. It's an right. amazing su- success story. Yeah. So, By the way, so, I, I'm taking I, I, I have all these people want to ask you questions. They can, I'm going sure. to ask you just one more question and then I'm going to open it up to uh, others. OK. Uh, and that is, are you uh, do you since you want to get reductions as quickly as possible on emissions, do you also support the idea of degrowth and lowering energy, total energy use, not through efficiency, but, you know, by scaling back energy usage? Are you also support that or is that? I, 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 it's not so. I, I, I don't, well, support it is, do I consider it a good idea or a plausible idea? Um, I mean, when I try to propose ideas, I I try to propose ideas that I think are at least practical in the real world. Um, Mm -hmm. Do I, uh, you know, (laughs) would it be good if people dramatically reduced their meat consumption? 
Well, obviously, it would be good for their health and it would be good for a lot of other reasons. And and so people understand, you know, the calories per acre required <laughs> from meat, you know, is at least 10 times. I mean, you know, at least yeah. one tenth, right? So yeah. you need 10 times as many acres to get a calorie from meat. And we don't have an infinite supply of acreage on this planet. That's, you know, that's pretty clear. So, okay. um, uh, so there are things I can imagine, but I don't, I don't, uh, you know, go around say, telling people that they should stop eating meat. You're not a degrowther or whatever. Uh, I don't think uh, because be I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know that it's a productive uh, uh, recommendation. I, okay. uh, I try to focus on the things that I think are in the realm of plausibility. Okay. So I'm going to um, turn on the uh, ability for people to unmute themselves, but please don't unmute or turn on your video until I call on you. And uh, we're going to start. And I would like everyone just to have like a 30 second question, because we don't really have a lot of time for everybody, but uh, hopefully we'll get through everybody if we can. 30 second question so we can get Joe's answer. And uh, and Stacy, I'll start with you again. Uh, was one of the co-mods. So do you have a quick question? Uh, yeah, I, I would just say um, I've seen and, and this is slightly off, but back to the um, hydrogen that I wanted to ask about. I, I've seen recently about all the investments that they're making, like this is some sort of resurgence into hydrogen for motor vehicles. I mean, I understand there are some cases where hydrogen might make sense in remote locations, et cetera, but for regular. And I just wondered if you knew what was behind that and why, why? Um, you know, I spent a lot of my career trying to figure out why people do really dumb things. And I've spent a certain amount of time trying to persuade them not to. I literally, in 2004, I wrote the hype about hydrogen, which ended up, I thought it was going to be a primer, but as I looked into it and talked to people, it really became an explanation of why you're never going to have hydrogen cars. And the, the, the way not, to think not, about Not enough people read that book, I think. <laughs> no, and I wrote a lot of pieces and I gave a lot of talks and meant some people got convinced, you know, Toyota could not be budged and it cost them a great deal. Um, and Shame. Shame. Um, so, um, you know, let me say two things. The reason why hydrogen doesn't make any sense is because it is grossly inefficient use of renewables and particularly in automotive. And that was so obvious that once people understood it, it became clear it didn't make sense because when you're talking about a hydrogen car, right? It, well, well, let me say, you start with a battery electric car and a renewable power, right? All you have to do is take the renewable power, you know, transport it through an electric power line, charge up the battery in the car and discharge it into the electric motor, right? The round trip efficiency of that from the renewable electricity into the electric motor, that's like 80%, right? You're still, you get 80% of the original electricity, maybe less. Um, now, maybe 75, depending on how, you know, the car is built and all that stuff. But if you're going to run a hydrogen car, you now have to take the renewable electricity, run it through an electrolyzer where you're immediately throwing away 30% of that electricity, right? Then you have to transport hydrogen, which is costs energy. Uh, you know, if you want to uh, 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 do it by truck, which is what you're going to do at the beginning, et cetera, et cetera. But the other point is once you get the hydrogen to the car, you're going to run through a fuel cell. And that fuel cell is maybe in the 40s of efficiency. So the whole round trip efficiency, the amount of electricity, of renewable electricity that ends up in the electric motor is like 25% of the original renewable electricity. You threw away like 75% of it. And along the way, you built an expensive electrolyzer and you build an expensive fuel cell and you had to figure out the whole distribution system for hydrogen, which is not easy to do compared to electricity because hydrogen today is nowhere and electricity is ubiquitous, right? So it's always going to be easier to distribute electricity than it is hydrogen. Uh, separate from the fact that hydrogen is a very dangerous gas and it is used in very, very specific, expensive circumstances in industrial settings to avoid uh, fires and explosions, all that sort of thing. So there is almost no way to, to get around that that remarkable inefficiency of of hydrogen compared to renewable. So the the, re the thing that I came to realize was that hydrogen 
you would only do hydrogen for any sector, any problem, if every other solution had failed first. It was never the thing you would do first. And if you could do electricity, if you could solve the problem with electricity, you were always going to do electricity. Just in the electricity. Well, I, I think to clarify, you mean uh, in, uh, you're not including fossil fuels in that. I mean, it, to replace fossil fuels any other way but hydrogen. Uh, you yes, would right, 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 yes, yeah. right, right. I mean, look, right. For like the steel, cement, and if you can use hydrogen, right. well, in look, those... heat, like heating, right? You would never use. I know that they talk about in Britain and the and the natural gas industry pushes this, but you you do not want to use hydrogen for heating. You don't want your neighbor to have hydrogen accumulating in their home. That is like the last thing you want. Any, I mean, natural gas is dangerous. Oh, the Hindenburgs right. are lovely. I mean, come on. Well, um, but I, yeah, I, um, okay. I've now in my mind, I'm going to refer to them as Rube Goldberg mobiles. And I don't, but I don't understand what, what wh is that an oil and gas thing? Like what is, is driving yeah. the obsession with hydrogen? I don't, it, it makes no sense to me. 95% of it is level. made Why? from fossil fuels today, right? So. so, so yes, what you are, it is correct. The things that the fossil fuel industry pushes very hard. Uh, our carbon capture and storage, because A, that inherently lets them keep doing what they want to do, which is just burn fossil fuels. And B, as you may know, 70%, we're the biggest uh, carbon capture and storage country in the world. And currently 70% of all the carbon we capture is used to squeeze out more oil from the ground, right? That's enhanced oil recovery. So, you know. But, yeah, but you know, but the reason, there's a good reason for that. It makes and, money. It's valuable. Yeah, well, but it was not that it makes money. It's until super recently with the 45Q and things, which is only a few years old. So up until a few years ago, it was the only way sure. you could get paid for carbon capture. So it's not a failure of carbon capture. It's a failure of policies to make people clean up their waste. You know, if you know if you right. were allowed to throw I'm your just, garbage saying, in somebody yeah. else's yard there'd be a lot of dirty yards around but uh, you know well but the, the the point is that the oil industry has a very vested interest until oh, yeah. someone passes a law saying you can't do that which clearly they're not going to do because the oil industry is very powerful i mean the oil industry is so powerful that in in the um uh you know inflation reduction act the 45q tax credit there is a tax credit Right for carbon capture and storage used for enhanced oil recovery, but but less. But yeah, less. it's less. But the point is, we're actually paying people to. But no, it does. It, the CO two does offset. I mean, it does stay down in that well, right after you're done with it. Right, so but it there is, is an offset. The, it's it's no compared to compared to just pumping it out of the ground without putting CO two down there. That's what the comparison is. Right. Um, but the point is, you're making it possible for a vast sea of in, in uneconomic oil to become economic. So you can't pretend that it has no difference effect in the world. No, well, no. I, by the way, my my I, my belief is we should phase it all out. <laughs> but you know, so, but uh, I'm, just I'm just saying. saying in the meantime. Right. Well, however, let me, let me, let's stop. Let, the, the question is what. The fossil fuel industry likes carbon capture and storage for a bunch of reasons. Correct. Um, they like hydrogen for a bunch of reasons, too. Uh, one of which is, is yes, 95% of all hydrogen is made from uh, uh, fossil fuels. Most of it is steam reforming of methane. Methane is CH4, right? One carbon, four hydrogens. So there's a lot of hydrogen sitting there, but there's that one carbon atom. So the fossil fuel industry really likes hydrogen because you could take methane and tell people, I'm going to capture the CO2 from this process, and I'm going to bury that, which, of course, I'm going to use to get more oil out of the ground. So hydrogen, in the fossil fuel industry's mind, hydrogen is just fossil fuels, right? They're, from them, there's no difference. And the proof of this, of course, is that in the... Um, to the Treasury Department, right? The question is, um, should you be allowed to make hydrogen, right? Uh, the, the best way to make hydrogen renewably is with an electrolyzer and renewable power, right? But if you don't build new renewables, you're just running it off the grid, right? And if you run it off the grid, then it's not very clean. I mean, it just, right, you're making some of the hydrogen- out of where it is, fuel. but yeah. So the, the Treasury Department has to make a decision Right in the for the I Inflation Reduction Act tax credit, do you get to use grid power, or do you have to use renewables 
uh, which is done by hour by hour. The best way you easy, not easiest, but you, you, you can do that by hour by, according to Princeton and other people's analysis, you can do that by hour by hour matching the electricity you purchase, ver the amount of electricity you purchase versus the amount of renewables that are on the grid. The point being is that all of the companies, including the fossil fuel companies, are lobbying the Treasury Department to let us run off of grid power, saying we need to develop this hydrogen industry. And even if it's polluting now, in 10 years, it'll be green and you'll want it because it's crucial to the future. And in fact, we don't know if the hydrogen industry is crucial to the future. All we know is that if you run it on grid power today, you're just adding to pollution. And yeah. But and that and they won in Europe too. So yes, the fossil fuel industry views hydrogen as equal to extending the life of fossil fuel industries, and in fact, making them more money because now they can use fossil fuels for a whole new purpose, which is making hydrogen, and then they can capture the CO two maybe and bury it underground. But in fact, to get more oil out of the ground. So yes, so let, let, let yeah. So, uh, by the way, so uh, Thank let's, you. Well, let's get back to onto right, Dak. <laughs> Even though that's very interesting, I'd love talking about that and I just had discussions yesterday about hydrogen so it's very timely with somebody who's a pro pro hydrogen person by the way um let's see let's uh, uh Eli you you're you're next as a co co mod there to uh if you have a question for Joe a short question for Joe so um okay I I get your argument um uh it, it's a two-part question number one what would be your strike price? Is it simply uh, equivalent to uh, um, reduc emissions reductions by renewables? What's your strike price per ton of CO2 where you stop objecting to DAC? Um, and related to that, um, you know, any any uh, price at scale depends both on the R and D of of the optimized technology and scaling it up, which which is kind of investment before it reaches that strike price. Um, how how do you figure that in, or is it just like no DAC until you know somehow it gets there? Um, the there's certainly, as you do research and development, as you do initial things, uh, you will get some clues as to whether you uh, th this is worth more investment or not. Um, now, you know, in some cases, it turns out it never works out. I mean, as you know, uh, nuclear power plants, uh, nuclear power from new plants has risen since 2009. And uh, in fact, it's risen in the last two decades. Um the the specific answer to your question is that certainly nobody knows what the number is. People have have often said that you you know the, the U.S. Department of Energy's uh, go, plan there what they say we need to do is get below hundred dollars a ton. Um, some people you know uh, when I, who I talk to say well you know uh, getting you know pretty close to a hundred. I, I would say that you know right now. Uh, you know, it's they're all you know one-off plants, uh, and you know we're talking about six hundred dollars a ton. And as I said, the the Climeworks people are not certain they can get below three hundred a ton. You know, there's a study out in July which compared a lot of different systems and found it very hot. You know, th they didn't think we were going to get down to a hundred. Uh, there are other people who don't think we're going to get down to hundred. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's worth trying a bunch of things to see if there are some pathways that hold some reasonable promise. And then if you find out which those are, you could certainly put more money. But there's a difference between the amount of money you do when you're doing going from research to development to demonstration to initial deployment versus the amount of money you spend on the things that you know work to push them even harder at scale. Because remember, um, you know, the literature is quite clear. If you've been running on a cost down a cost curve, a learning curve for like two decades, you're going to continue for another two decades. That There's a very good chance of that. So if you spend a lot of money on batteries and a lot of money on solar and a lot of money on wind, you're also going to bring them down the cost curve. So the, 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 the reason why there's no steady, you know, one answer to your question is you can't assume the competition is static. And this is, you know, when you talk to direct air capture people, and there was, there was actually a very, you know, you know, uh, uh, good articles on this 
you know, th there are two, re I I've seen a lot of business plans in the course of my life in energy, you know, as you can imagine, five years in the US Department of Energy. They all, the, the ones that uh, don't succeed, which is, you know, 95% of them, they make one of two mistakes. Either they assume that their technology is going to improve in cost and performance faster than it does, or that they imagine that the competition is actually basically not going to improve in cost and performance, that it's going to remain static. In the real world, your competitors are getting lots of money too. And so... Um, I think that right now there is no, I would put it this way, right now there is no reason to think that direct air capture is going to be cost effective um, at all, right? There, it Could it be? Yes. But is there, when I say there's no reason to think, I'm saying, is there enough basis in what we know about direct air capture and the, and the technologies out there to plan policy around the belief that if we just pour enough money into it, it's going to be a very big deal by 2050. Is there enough reason to believe that? No. Does that mean it's not worth spending any money on? No, it doesn't mean that. But it means I know if I spend money on solar and wind and batteries and electric vehicles and heat pumps and replacing fossil fuels that exist today, those are sure things. That is money mm. in the bank. It's cheap and it's efficient. So but also we have to talk about who's spending the money. I, I, I think if the government phases out fossil fuels with policy, the government will not be do that. The, no, 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 no. Well, look, the government, we're not doing any of the things we're talking about today. We're not phasing out fossil fuels but we're doing a, by 2050. Energy. We are deploying clean energy. We are deploying at a rapid rate. Absolutely. We are electrifying transportation. We're but it's not because the government's spending money on it. They are oh, spending sure some is. money on well, some of it, some subsidies. It's now the cheapest form of energy. Right. right? But thanks to so if we if we China pass and... a policy, which becomes easier as it becomes cheaper to have replacements, pass a policy to phase out fossil fuels, the industry, without the government spending a dime, will build incredible amounts of renewable to sure. replace the missing fossil fuels. So government doesn't have to spend a dime on that. You have to spend the dimes on the thing. Removing past emissions, nobody wants to pay for that. Who are you going to get to pay for past crimes, right? So that's something the government has to do. And uh, and by the way, the cost, the, the question isn't, I, I know the question to you is which is cheaper, but you say it's not cost effective. The question is, what is the cost of not removing the CO2 from the atmosphere? The a, there isn't there isn't a cost there it's, the point, it's, 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 it's everything what do you mean no it's nothing huh how, how can it how can there be a cost to removing uh uh, uh to not removing uh tons from the air I'll just buy, if, 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 you, if you have lung cancer no, and no, you're no, going no, to no. get don't, an don't, operation we don't need an analogy we don't need an analogy we have the numbers None. how can it be a cost let, let me finish. How can it be a cost? You're telling me it's better to spend three hundred dollars a ton. Climate damage, right? But the, the climate cost. damage is done is reduced more cheaply by a factor of ten to a hundred today by not putting it there in the first place. No, no, no. Okay, I'm sorry. And then, by the way, the whole the whole argument really boils. We're not disagreeing about any of the like the technologies or, or anything here. Uh, and I, I, I mean, I think there's a little different. I do believe that at gigaton scale, not at megaton, but at gigaton scale, price is going to go below $100. By the way, it's not necessarily going to look like anything like the climate. It might be dumping some iron in the ocean or some other way of doing it. So, but by exploring this and the X Prize, for example, has a $100 million prize to come up with the best way to do carbon. And some of them are what we're talking about. Some of them are mineral crushing. Some of them are ocean. They're all different things. So it doesn't matter. As you said, a ton is a ton. So if those things work in the future, I do see us getting down to $50 a ton, in which case 40 gigatons a year will cost $2 trillion a year. And my point is that if you are correct, that every time you do anything for carbon removal, you have taken away from renewables, well, then you're right. I don't see any reason why that is true because there are so many other things. That why why, why even pick DAC? Why not pick cruise ships or apartment buildings? Or 
anything else want, that humans because spend people money want on. Cruise ships. People are paying for cruise ships because they want them, and they, they also want to live over climate buildings because they want them. No one's going to pay for direct air capture until there's a price for CO two. Totally. Well, or or the government mandates it, or pays for it. One of the, yeah, right, one you, of those. I, I don't want people to be left with the impression you could say the government's going to mandate we shut down all fossil fuels, but that's clearly but again not we're not talking about the world today because if we're talking about let's see even a gigaton right we're talking about something let's let's say it's twenty years from now that we're at a gigaton scale right shit's going to be hitting fan all over people will be clamoring for solutions they're not doing that today. So I don't think we can compare. You can't say, well, cruise ships, everybody wants them today. And I say, if you're going to say that DAC trades off against renewables, when, by the way, you don't even have to, government doesn't have to pay a dime for renewables if they, well, even if they don't phase out fossil fuels, because it's cheaper, right? But if you want to speed it up, you phase out fossil fuels. Government doesn't pay anything. It just passes the law. Society saves money because renewables are cheaper, far, far cheaper than fossil fuels when you include all the health costs, climate costs, as sure. get rid of the seven trillion dollars in subsidies to start with. So so you don't have to spend the government doesn't have to spend any money on renewables. It just has to pass some reasonable well, change policies and put new policies in place. Therefore, the money it spends on should be scaling up DAC. Um, but OK. But, all right. But that, uh, we talk cover that. Let, let's I don't, I don't want to take all your time. Eric. <laughs> Eric, you can unmute and turn your video on and ask. I, I need uh, I need uh, sixty seconds. Okay, all right. Well, we well. That, so while Joe is away, I'll tell you uh, if you missed it earlier. Uh, some big news that uh, climate scientist James Hansen has agreed to be on Climate Chat on uh, tentatively on December seventeenth after he gets back from the COP twenty eight uh, meeting in Dubai. And he tells me, like I said, we're going to talk about his pipeline paper that we covered often already here. But he said, ah, it's old news. I want to uh, talk about new things. So I haven't had, haven't had a chance yet to find out what that is. So should be a very exciting uh, uh, thing. And in the meantime, we need to build up, even though we had ton, thousands of followers on, on uh, Clubhouse, we only have hundreds on YouTube Live. So please... Even if you're on the Zoom call, either now or later, uh, go to the Climate Chat homepage. You can just search Climate Chat Club on YouTube and you'll get there. You'll see uh, some great um, older interviews with folks like we talked about Klaus Lackner talking about carbon capture, Kevin Anderson talking about how uh, uh, DAC isn't, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be used for net getting to net zero. Um, yeah, you know, communi communicators like David Fenton and George Marshall and things like that. So a lot of good stuff. And subscribe and hit the notification bell. I, the first time I'm saying this, by the way, hit that notification bell, folks, as we're as we shift uh, climate chat onto YouTube Live. So with that, Joe is back. And Eric, uh, please, what's your question for Joe? Okay, so if you were evaluating Joe, um, a business plan, um, that was doing things like. Um, building eventually very large ocean-based um, phytoplankton farms and then building and using them to make carbon sequestering, carbon negative products, like building materials and stuff um, by taking um, phytoplankton or kelp or something um, and turning it into, you know, I don't know, reinforced carbon, carbon, you know, super materials and then making them into building um, uh, the equivalent of, uh, well, I mean, various kinds of bricks and stuff for making roads, for making um, housing. Um, is, it, is there something kind of automatically irrational about that, where we're taking sunlight from the ocean, right? So we're not using farmland, we're not using, you know, we're taking sunlight from the ocean and growing something using a natural system and then using an unnatural system um, to sequester it. What, what insight can you give us about that kind of direction? Um, well, look, I, look, by the way, there are many things that can't scale that people can still make a lot of money off of. And I, I want to be clear on that, right? Uh, you know, as you may know, in the, I think Bill Gates is uh, breakthrough energy fund, right? He doesn't, he won't fund anything that doesn't get you a gigaton of CO2 per year, right? That's, uh, but I don't want people to have to write a business plan and say, this is going to get me a gigaton of CO2. If it can't, could you make a lot of money just doing what you're saying? 
at a certain amount of scale? Yeah, it could it be a good idea? Yes. Does it mean that it's a major solution to climate change? You know, I can't tell you that today. Probably not. But again, that's not a reason not to do it. Uh, we, you know, not everybody's going to do things that can scale all the way up. I mean, to a billion tons a year, that's a staggering scale, right? And I think we could all agree that the bigger you scale up, the more challenges you're going to hit. Um, what you're describing seems, uh, uh, you know, like it might be a good idea. I think, I think the practical challenge is if you're going to grow a lot offshore, uh, you know, you're introducing a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, operational challenges as someone who's, you know, advised startups, um, you know, the more, the more unusual steps that you have to take for something to work, right, the less likely it is, it is to work. So if you're saying that the only place you can really grow this is offshore, and then you're going to have to gather it and bring it onshore and then find a business to sell it to, right? You're going to need a pretty good distribution system, right? Where are these, where are these businesses? How far are they all on the shore, right? If they're not on the shore, how far are you going to have to transport them? Transport costs are fatal to a lot of bioenergy systems, right? There aren't very many bioenergy plants that use, let's say, uh, crops, where you have to move the crops a thousand miles, right? Because crops are not a dense form of energy, right? That's the whole point of biomass is it's the, it uses the sunlight, but it's inefficient. So it's not right. The, the, uh, so to transport biomass other than wood, right, is quite inefficient and it's going to cost you in transport and you're going to have to transport it on right carbon free trucks and all those things, which we'll have. But in other words, so the point is, yeah, I, I I think you always have to look at the those infrastructure costs and how they affect the life cycle analysis. Okay, right? let's let's go and on. One uh, really, no, we, oh, we, we, we got eight minutes left with Joe. I want to keep it to two hours, like he asked, and we have uh, people can people. reach me. Did we put? Uh, uh, I should put my my uh, on on both of my papers on the website. I yeah. have put my my email address at Correct. the University of Pennsylvania. And in the comment section on YouTube, there's a link to Joe's publication page. Click on one of the papers. Why direct air capture? His email is right there, so you can. And I can drop. Talk. I can while you're talking. Well, again, the Zoom is only a small number of the people that are going to see oh, this okay. this talk. Right. So, but you can do that. That'd be fine. Uh, the people here are even more interested in getting in touch with you, so that'd be fine. Uh, Chanakya, welcome uh, to uh, Climate Chat. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Joe. Like I. Have been reading uh, your uh, the the viral book and I love it. I remember in it you mentioned that uh, Van Jones used to have MLK's talks on his iPod. Yes. So I have your book as the audible book and I read it. I listen to it in the gym all the time. So I love oh, well, everything you do. Please don't please don't compare me to to uh, Dr. King. But I appreciate <laughs> I, I I appreciate that that uh, and and by the way, listening to Dr. King's speeches is still a very good way to become a better speaker. There's no question about that. Very good. Perfect. And the reason I wanted to say hi was because now I'm, I like you, I had a technical background, so I did an engineering degree. I'm about, I'm starting a second degree in climate change, but I'm focusing on the communications aspect of climate change. Yeah. Oh, so I would love if you could talk a minute or two about like how we could better communicate climate change. Wow, it's a great question. And Joe is one of the leaders in this. So that please, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that's that that we could do two hours on that. <laughs> we could. Uh, we should, by um, the way. Let's do that separately. Look, I, I think the, the first thing that I would say, what what is the mo single most important thing one can say about this is that everybody needs to talk more about climate change. You know, and this is this came out of the work by you know Tony Lazarowitz at the Yale Climate Communication Center, and we're, you know working with the the G the George Mason people. Um, if you, if you run a survey, right, and you ask people how what, when, how often do you talk about climate change, right, and the answer is you know may at, you know maybe once a month at mo you know at most, and most people haven't talked about it for a long time, right. So if if people don't talk about climate change it's going to be very hard to persuade people that it's an existential crisis, right? Because they're going to use their little heuristic to mm -hmm. think, well, if this is such a, you know, existential problem, why is not everybody talking about it all the time, right? We talk about like, is what's going on in the Mideast, 
right? You know, AI, right? Everyone talks about AI all the time. So, so yes, the very first thing, I know, and I know we all feel reluctant at parties <laughs> to be the person who brings this up. And even not, I not, not all, not all, not all, but you know, <laughs> we, we have to get to the point where we do feel comfortable talking about this mm-hmm. with friends and family, because otherwise everyone's going to have this view that, oh, these are just alarmists, right? The way you move from being an alarmist to being a mainstream view is if enough people start talking about it. But if they don't, then you're always going to be, you know, in, in a subset of people that you that people will dismiss. So I think job That's one great. is to talk about a lot. of And this job two is you if you're going to talk about climate change, you do have to become knowledgeable on a very broad spectrum of issues because people will have been exposed to the myths and the disinformation, right? Because the, the the oil companies, the others, they spend staggering amounts of money to put out the myths. So you have to know that about wind turbines and birds, and you have to know about whales, and you have to know about power lines, and you have to know, but you also have to know that climate isn't is is cyclical, but it's also forced by CO2, right? So you know, you will find that once you start doing that, you'd better have those answers pretty cold. And there's a good site. You know the the even the left science, work. yeah, yeah, yeah science. Com. science has has you know a good list of what those myths are and how to answer them. But yes, you know, learn the cogent answer to major questions and and then repeat it. By the way, so Joe, you've written so many books over the time, especially on communications. If you were to recommend a current, your your what's your latest? What you should, what what do you recommend people take a look at if they're interested? in your your uh your books or well i think things. i think the book that was just the last book that i did i i is is on communications is how to go viral and reach millions and that that book talks about everything i know about storytelling i mean that's the other piece of information this is something that ed mayback said on a panel that i i have borrowed ever since but i like to credit him he's just four words um numbers numb and stories sell so like that. you know, ninety five percent of effective communications is just telling stories. And if you did nothing but stand up in front of people and tell stories, you would be a better public speaker than ninety five and maybe ninety nine percent of people on this planet, right? Very That's good. the way Excellent. our brains have evolved. Oh, the development of language was done concurrently with storytelling, and our brains are very much wired uh, to think in terms of stories. And stories deliver information unbelievably efficiently. So that I can say to you the words Sherlock Holmes and those two words, that creates a whole world, right? That's the power of stories, right? I can, two words can create a whole image in your head, a whole storyline, right? So that's why you want to refer to stories because stories are what is embedded in people's minds of how they look at the world. Very good. Brian, what's your 30 second question for, for Joe? Uh, first, just a very uh, brief comment and then a question, and that is that the answer on the transport offshore has already been addressed. It turns out that bio crude going into oil tankers, when done, um, can be carbon negative and uh, climate positive uh, when you're growing uh, algae offshore uh, and processing it offshore into bio crude. So there's a very interesting transport economics there. I'm happy to follow up later with you on but uh, specifically, I think there's an interesting question, and that is to ask, um, uh, once you get to zero emissions under your scenario, how do you propose getting back to a healthy climate, if not by carbon removal? Oh, I think that you're probably going to want to do carbon removal uh, at that point, um, as much as you can that's cost effective. W- w- the, the point that I've been trying to make, which perhaps uh, uh, not been making effectively, is that point is a very long time from now. I mean, it is a very long time from now. You know, in the best case scenario, it's a long time from now. On our current pace, you know, it is certainly certainly after 2050. And um, I don't, is there a scenario in which it's much before 2050 in the real world? I don't think so. And therefore, uh, do I think that you are gonna have to be scaling up uh, direct air capture uh, you know, we're not going to scale up direct air capture, I would say, in the best case scenario, after 2040. 
So we have 17 years to develop, you know, the one thing you don't want to do is scale up the thing that doesn't turn out to be one of the better things, right? It's very easy to do technology lock-in on the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. If the government backs the wrong thing or subsidizes the wrong thing, and you end up with what? You end up with corn ethanol, right? So, which which would be better off to have no corn ethanol uh, than well, to have... Uh, half, if half the land used for corn ethanol was converted to solar PV, you could power the entire United States. Absolutely. Right. How are you going to keep people from, you know, transcontinental or, or intercontinental flying between 2035 and 2050? You're not going to get to zero emissions. Unless you're going to tell everybody to stop flying between continents. And how are you going right. to do so that? So that comes towards the end, right? That's You're talking about the hardest thing to deal with, right? No, you no, want no. to get to zero. You want to get to actual zero, and you're going to yeah. tell people to stop flying intercontinentally. But so let me finish here. Stop, stop, stop. Very hard. And how you're, are you going to get you're that? You're missing the point. Thing. You're missing the point. You don't have to get to zero. If you look at what the science-based technology initiative says, is you reduce your own emissions 90 to 95%. And at that point, if you want to zero out your rest, right, this is the this is what it means to be net zero for a company. You mm -hmm. reduce your own emissions 90 to 95%. And you if you do that, then you can do the last five to 10% with high quality carbon removal, right? So if you're telling me that we might in the year 2045 want to do some direct air capture before we get the last tons out from flying, I would say that is possible. I would also say it is equally possible that in 20 years, we will have a zero carbon jet fuel that is cheaper than direct air capture. And you can't tell me that I'm wrong. So oh, no, it, I'd encourage the use of uh, biofuels, carbon right. negative. So let's pursue them level. both at an R&D and D level. Yeah. Well, well, what about the D level for carbon removals? What about the D wait, 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 I don't want to take too much of his time, Brian. We Thank do you. do a lot of demonstration there. People, let, let's be clear here. I'm a very big fan. I ran the largest art research and development demonstration program in the world uh, at the time for all climate solutions. I'm a very big fan of that. But I'm also realistic that the vast majority of things that you do research, development, and demonstration on never get commercial. And most of the ones that get commercial could never scale up, you know, to the level that we're talking about. No one thinks about trying to scale up things to the level we're talking about in order to scale something. So the point is not that it's not worth doing the R, D, and D. What it's not worth is thinking that the R, D, and D is going to lead to a scalable commercial product any time in the next quarter century. That is not a very likely thing. And when you compare yeah. that to all the work we have to do now with the stuff that we know works, there's no comparison. We need to spend trillions on the stuff we know work. And I, if we do that, then I'm happy to spend billions or 10 billion or 20 billion on the stuff that might work post 2040, post 2045. I, I want to be very clear on that. I'm just trying to draw a distinction between what we bet the farm on, which is the stuff that works, and then the, all the speculative stuff that we start 100 flowers knowing that maybe one or two are going to bloom. But we could I think bloom. We can agree that both, yeah, yeah, both are underfunded. Yeah. So we need to fund both. Well, everything's underfunded. And also, just to call out, Joe, what you mentioned earlier, you're not necessarily against doing uh, sunlight reflection methods in the meantime, if it's necessary to keep us going. You you didn't comment directly, but you didn't, you didn't turn it down when, when I brought I, it up. I, th this is such a hot topic that there's no short answer. Okay. I, I, will, <laughs> I, I would just say the following. Um, we're not close to being desperate, which we should be. Um, and therefore, we're not doing a bunch of things that we might do if we were desperate. If the world were appropriately desperate, would we seriously entertain solar radiation management? Of course we could. We would. Does it mean we would do it at large scale? I don't know. Right. That's up to governments. It's a very, you know, it's got a lot of, you know, legal and moral and other issues sure, that sure, I sure, can't sure. get into. I'm just saying, right. Yes. Um if we ever woke up and said, Jesus Christ, we would, we're really stupid and immoral for not doing everything in our power to keep warming below two degrees Celsius, right? Right. Any humane intelligent species would do everything in their power starting now <laughs> to keep 
warning. Well, Intelligence before. question mark, I guess. Well, uh, so far. We got to name ourselves Homo sapiens sapiens. So we, right. you know, when you get to name yourself, you get to pretend that you're the intelligent species. And Brian, there's another Brian, B-R-Y-A-N. Brian, uh, do you have a question for Joe? Your last yeah, question. kind of a comment and kind of question. When we start talking about all these things, I think sometimes we forget to look at the full system and take the full approach. I mean, I work in livestock and in crop production. Oh. Turn off your video because your turn off your, video, yeah, you yeah. turn off your video because your audio is not coming through and you're freezing. Get about the fact of how we can cycle neutral. What? Uh, okay. Uh, livestock, livestock and crop ground and interaction between the microbial life that gets forgotten quite a bit when we're talking about all of this and we take it down to such a level we forget about the interaction of the microbial and. Yes, could we remove livestock and go plant-based and quote unquote have less of an impact? Maybe, but I think we're forgetting the full systems approach that even biodynamic and organic farms need to get fertilizer from somewhere. And instead of having all these byproducts from human food that would go to waste, we can upcycle that through livestock and ruminant animals. So I wanted so to- wait, what's, your, to what's your question? Attention. What's your question for Joe? Uh, why why are we not looking at the full system cycle i mean we can break down like direct air capture and whatnot but why are we not looking at the full systems of what we can do now more and actually promote livestock integration into some of this and reduce our waste that way and upcycle it well okay, uh, here's what i would say i agree that you have to take a systems approach and i think probably among the largest sinks that we need to further develop is soils and i don't i don't uh, I, I'm sure you know, most people here would agree with that. We 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 have not done enough research. Now, soils are tricky to deal with because you have to s figure out how much carbon is in them all the way down and then monitor it over time. But clearly, there are things like biochar and other things that that deserve a a experimentation at a pretty large level over time to see uh, which could be the most cost effective ways because. Um, we, we we right now, as you know, we're losing more and more carbon from our soil because people keep digging it up for cities and, you know, or whatever, you know, or even corn ethanol. Right. We, we took the conservation reserve land and we put corn ethanol on that. So, you know, we, we clearly are not taking a systems approach and um, whether we can get to a point where we do, you know, certainly that's a key part of the solution, you know, in the future. Are people going to, you know, at the end of this century, are people going to be eating a lot of a, a lot of meat grown on, you know, uh, agricultural land? Uh, it's got to be very different than it is now because we're not going to have the land. I mean, even in the year 2050, right, we're going to have two billion more people. Some people think we're going to need over a billion acres, just more acres just to feed people. Right. And there's just not a lot of billion acres lying around to plant crops on in this world. Right. I mean, it's just, you know, so land is going is one of the things we didn't talk a lot about. Land is one of the greatest challenges, you know, for figuring out how we're going to do everything we need to do in mid-century, you know, particularly in a world where the climate is changing. We have wildfires, you know, and sea level rise and saltwater infiltration. So, you know, yes, we have a lot of problems that need to be solved simultaneously, and, and that can only be done with systems thinking. Well, with with that is kind of a nice way to kind of end it there. I, Joe, I want to thank you so much for being on the program. I, I thought it was a great discussion uh, highlighted the fact that we should have a, a separate discussion on climate communications, which is, by the way, one of the one of the main subjects of of climate chat as well. We we realize here that not only is the technology you know needed, and that we have to understand the science and the solutions, but as we're seeing, that doesn't happen fast enough unless we also figure out the communications problem, which I think is the hardest one of all of them, actually. And, and yeah, and you're the and you're one of the experts on that. We had George Marshall on, we had David Fenton oh. on. And so I'd love to oh, have George another Marshall. another yeah, discussion with you uh, on that sure. in a separate program. But thank you so much for this. I'd love to talk to you another hour sure. hour about Please. DAC and, and all. But uh, uh, thank you for spending so much time with us. Um, and uh, not only did you know, a bunch of people see this now, but uh, as we grow the channel, this will be the replays will be available for anyone and uh and that's going to be very helpful as well to people so thank you so much for your oh, time maybe, today maybe yeah. someday on clubhouse because i 
I haven't been on in a while, but I I used to have I have a lot this of is on Clubhouse too. So we're oh, we stream, are? okay. We're streaming to Clubhouse and we're streaming uh -huh. to YouTube. And I'm looking at tools tools to stream to Twitch and other things too. But step at a time. This is the first time we're doing. We we have streamed to YouTube before, but it was always an instantly created room, uh -huh. which means no one knew about it ahead of time. So it was right. harder. So this is the first time we were successful in nice. streaming it to a, a room that I posted already about. So as we get better at it, we'll we'll do better. Um, and I want to remind everyone listening uh, one last time, uh, Dr. James Hansen, one of the foremost climate scientists in the world, will be our special guest uh, tentatively on December 17th, right here on YouTube and on Zoom and on Clubhouse. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. And with that, Joe, thank you again. Any last word, any um, any, you want to tell anybody what your work, what your next event is or next paper or anything like that before we, we go? Um, uh, well, it's funny. I, I come to the view, uh, not surprisingly that perhaps my next paper should be on hydrogen. Okay. Uh, so All right. that is, that is definitely at the very top of my list. Fantastic. Well, let's talk about that. We have a lot of things we can talk about anyway. And thanks Stacy. Yeah. And thanks Eli. Well, and hydrogen. I, Cause I'm, I just can't believe how it's popping up again. And it's, it's, um, that it's also it's also popping down by the way denmark shut all their stations there's there's a lot of ramp down of hydrogen happening at the same time the hype continues so it, yeah anyway, and we're yeah. gonna put it in our trains and our cars and everything and it's like i i i, I yeah, yeah I, I would just say about when people actually people talk about it a lot until they actually start to do it and when they well, have to pay to, for it <laughs> right they have to pay for it they have to do the safety stuff that they didn't know about right and they have to do the distribution but stuff but it's the government that's putting the money towards it at least that's the thing that it's ca has caught my eye it's like when the federal government says you know Jennifer Granholm is like here we're giving this money to hydrogen Newsom is saying oh we're doing this for hydrogen and i'm just like oh my god by the way but i i, I will yeah. say even though i don't disagree with that but the money we give to fossil fuels wants everything else a tr globally a trillion dollars of direct subsidies last year direct and seven trillion dollars of uh, well six trillion dollars more of indirect subsidies the money the, the billions going to hydrogen don't, doesn't even show up on that so i we have to keep our eye on the prize and i do and by the way i do think hydrogen will be useful for a lot of things uh, but, but as you mentioned you got to really think about what they are it's not road transportation definitely not road transport now with that, thank you so much. I look forward to that paper. We have a lot of things to talk about here on Climate Chat with you, Joe. So <laughs> communications, hydrogen, and uh, everything else. We didn't even really talk about Bex, but totally agree. I, I, By the way, on Bex, I'll just say, I always thought Bex was simply a placeholder name yeah. that IPCC used to try to make it so they could explain it to policymakers what it was. And they thought maybe DAC was too complicated. I never thought they thought it would actually be a real thing but i could be totally wrong well, i'll just I... say but you know before i go i'll just say you know a minute on bex okay Bex's, bioenergy carbon capture and storage was the first climate solution totally invented by the modelers right <laughs> there's no one who in the industry who came to him and said this is a good thing we should really put this in the models really right it, it doesn't make a lot of sense and you know the easiest way to think about it is in the steady state uh biomass is can be relatively carbon neutral but when you scale it up, what you end up doing is just chopping down more trees every year. And mm -hmm. maybe you plant the seedlings to replace them, but it doesn't matter because effectively what you're doing is deforestation. As long as you're scaling it up, you're deforesting and you're adding CO2 to the atmosphere. And we did some modeling and that that's just very clear in the literature. And, but you are capturing the CO2 when you burn them. But you're saying I think what you're saying is a big tree will absorb more CO2 from the forest than a, a seedling that replaces it is that is that the issue when you do the no one does the life cycle analysis right when you do the life cycle analysis right right you chop down a tree right so that has several emissions costs the first of course is that you lose all the future carbon that that tree would have stored exactly, right? exactly. sucked up right so that's a b of course you get all the emissions from you know the 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 detritus right the the you know you've cut down a tree the, then you're going to transport you have to dry it right because you can't burn uh, stuff with a high moisture content because then the heat goes into the moisture not into the right so you got to do all this energy all the way then you run then you burn it in a biomass plant right mm -hmm. and you release all the other co2 emissions 
And because you capture, then you capture it under Bex. You capture least. some percentage of, but as you know, when you put the carbon capture and storage system on the biomass plant, you ha- you use up 30 to 40 percent of the energy just running the carbon capture and storage system, right? That's the parasitic loss. So mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and then you plant the seedlings. And over time, the seedlings grow and absorb CO2 to get back to an energy balance. But that takes time. And if you keep chopping down a greater number of trees each year because you're scaling it up, that carbon debt grows every year until you stop scaling. And effectively, (laughs) all that you're scaling up BEX is, is a lot like deforestation. It's not from a modeling point of view, very different. Anyway, that's all. In the yeah, paper. but are there people that besides the modelers? I'm not. I don't hear about Bex out in the climate community, except when they're talking about the IPC says Bex. So, are there other people besides the modelers who are pushing for it, or is it? I don't even know. I mean, I just well, as I, I agree know, with you. It's a, it doesn't sound like a good idea. <laughs> the, the corn ethanol people view uh, right, right. They people may not know this. Of all the carbon capture and storage systems that are uh, in late stage development for 2024, um, like, and there's about, I don't know, 35, 36, 30 of them are putting carbon capture and storage on a biorefinery. On an ethanol plant, yeah. An ethanol plant to capture. But that you have pure CO2, so that's much easier to do. You do, but you only end up with the one carbon atom. You're still stuck with the two carbon atoms in the corn ethanol, right? So you're only siphoning off a little bit. And since corn ethanol is such a disastrously bad idea, that one carbon atom doesn't make it a whole lot better. I mean, just say, I mean, it's amazing how much, how inefficient the whole, I mean, it is. I don't even know, it's 0.05% when you're all done, if you're lucky. Uh, but taking half that land, putting solar panels on, and you Absolutely. power the entire United States, <laughs> it tells you all you need to know. You know. Yeah, it, it is the case that if you compare, a, like, by using a, a land for biomass to to run a bioenergy plant, you can get fifty to one hundred times as much electricity from running solar on that. Yeah, right. Yes, twenty five percent panels versus, a, if you're lucky, it plants two percent. But when you're done with whatever you're doing to turn it into energy, you're lucky okay. if you have a quarter of that. Absolutely, it's yeah. it's it's it's. Wow. And what's more, trees are a good thing. We really should just <laughs> let them grow and store CO two. That's yeah, I agree with that's that. what we should be doing with our trees. Yeah. So, by the way, that's one reason I want to spend a lot of time about. It, it, yeah. it just seems like not a good idea all around, and not too many people pushing for it. Except, I think, as you said, the modelers, which again, I always thought they're just using it as an example, as opposed to the one they're really proposing. But well, well the tragedy know. is not the bioenergy carbon capture and storage. It's all the bioenergy without carbon capture and storage that Europe is doing for the last mm. fifteen years, right? Pellets, they, uh, wood pellets, they've been doing. And- even worse than bioenergy carbon. They haven't been capturing the carbon. They've just been chopping down more and more trees. You know, there's that New York Times piece last year about deforesting Finland and Estonia and 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 Romania. So yes, bioenergy without carbon capture and storage, that's 60% of the growth in renewable electricity in Europe in the past 15, 20 years. 60%. That's why these policies are very important because if you yeah. count that as... Quote, clean. They're trying to count natural gas as clean. You know, none of these things are clean. Policy is really important because what you say yeah. you're going to get and you might not want what you get if, if it's like that. So that's uh, yeah. that's a very important whole subject. Uh, subject. Thanks again for t- talking to uh, uh, talking to us about DAC and the issues and and sort of being OK with the sort of the pushback and the back and forth. I think it makes a much more interesting discussion, too. So I think that's good. Thank you for the extra time. We went over, but yeah, uh, I'll bit, try yeah. to be more careful in the future. And everyone, thanks again. Follow us on YouTube, Climate Chat, and uh, get the, both the subscribe and the notification. And this will be available for replay if you missed any of it. Uh, so thanks again, Joe. Joe Rom, everyone. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye.